I'd like to welcome you all here this morning. My name is Noni Fitzgerald. I'm the Director of Finance and Support Services from Clare County Council. Apologies from the Chief Executive, he isn't available this morning. Our Cahirlach of Clare County Council will join us shortly. I'd like to welcome the Mayor of Venice Municipal District, our TD, our Senator is also joining us, and our members of Clare County Council. Councillor Howard, Councillor McGettigan, Councillor Colin Malloy, and Councillor Norton. This morning's um, event is an initiative from the Programme from Government to promote equality and diversity in local government. I see an awful lot of young faces here this morning, so listen to the speakers. Understand the business of public service or of civil service and ask lots of questions. In 1919, we had our first female minister in Contes Markovich. We have seen two female presidents during our time, and there's 34 out of the doll out of 158 female. For Thonishta, and here in Clare, we've been well represented with Sheila de Valera, Madeleine Taylor Quinn, who is going to join us shortly, Deputy Violet Ann Wynne, who is here with us, and Senator Roisin Garvey who will all be here with us this morning, as are our own ministers. For those of you who have an interest in this area, there's a really good book out there by Martina Fitzgerald, political correspondent, The Women at the Table of Irish Politics. It's interviews with a lot of our female members who have made it to high levels within government, and it's really good to see how they secured a place at the top table. I suppose from my own experience in public service, which isn't political life, but in our jobs in the council, we are very involved in politics, in how we make our decisions. We have seven members of management team. Four of us are women. I am the first head of finance in Clare County Council since the council was established over 100 years ago. And across 31 local authorities, we are very well represented. So within public service, within my own team, I have a team of six people who report to me across corporate services, HR and finance. Five of the six are female. So we have a lot of women in a lot of senior positions. There's a lot of good bodies out there supporting women in this area. I want to welcome Michelle this morning from She. Very easy to remember, see her elected. And Michelle is going to be involved here this morning. But also, you have women's networks. You have Corlin and Oge. You have all the political parties have young members, groupings. You have immigrant councils and others. But also, when you look deeper dive, Clare Local Development Company, the PPN, a lot of strong women involved in these groups, our local community groups, and even, I was speaking to Councillor Howard this morning, Ennis Tidy Towns haven't reached the highest level, and I'm sure she'll mention it, very strong women involved in that group for years. So you don't need to go to the higher level in politics, community groups, quite a lot of involvement. So don't be dismayed. We are there, but you need to understand why there aren't more. And it's great that everybody has joined us here today. Excellent agenda here today. I want to thank Sinead for facilitating, Michelle for being here, empowering women to engage in politics, I want to thank my own team for organising today. Anne Reynolds, Sinead Hahasi, Mary McMahon, Ken Fitzsimons, and Connor McCarthy. We also need to thank the department for supporting this today, Owen Cleary and his team in the Department of Housing, Planning, and Local Government. So I ask you to sit back, listen. Don't worry if you miss any elements. We have Paul up the back who is recording it for us and we will be putting it up on the Clare website and also pushing it on social media. So you will get the opportunity to look back on it and you'll also get the opportunity to share it with friends. Thank you very much. I pass you back to Sinead. Thank you, Dolan. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah, yeah great. Listen, it's great to be here with you today. Um, as Nolene said, my name is Sinead Doody and I'm the facilitator for the day. Um, 
I'm based here in Clare, so I'm a Clare woman. So it's great to be with so many great Clare men and women today, and hopefully we'll have a great morning. Um, my job essentially today is to keep the show on the road, okay? So what I'll be doing over the next few hours is I'll be navigating the various conversations and the debates and the chats that we'll be having with our great list of speakers and panelists who are here today. So it's a great opportunity to hear from the women of Clare who are involved at all levels in political life and in community life and to get to hear from their views around their experiences of being in politics, the challenges, the obstacles, um, and what has, I suppose, uh, driven them forward in their own. From my own perspective, I think this is an extremely important conversation that we're having today. My background is community development and social inclusion, and I've been lucky enough to work all over the country with groups and organizations in equality and in diversity and inclusion. And one of the things I, will, um, I know for sure is that every day all over the country, decisions are made that affect our lives. So there are people in institutions and structures, there are people in political organizations, in the Doyle, uh, in local government, that every day it's their job to make decisions. And that's important because we live in a democracy and somebody has to keep the country going and that's their job. The question for me, and I suppose my big passion is around um, ensuring or, or around um, the rights of people, the rights of us as citizens to have a say in issues that affect their lives. And so today, obviously, we're talking about the gender imbalance that exists in relation to the voice of women and the fact that we have a very, very low uh, percentage of women in decision-making roles in uh, local government, in national government, and in all of our, uh, in all of our um, institutions and structures. So today is about talking about that. Uh, I think it's great that there are so many young people in the audience you know, we're talking about the right of people to have a say. We're talking about the right of people to have a voice. Ye are the, the citizens of today, all the young people, but you're the voice of tomorrow. You know, so you're the, the voters of tomorrow. You're the activists of today. I think the fact that you're here today means that you're interested, that you're already engaging in, activist, uh, in, in advocacy by virtue of your presence here. But you're the voters of tomorrow, as I said. You're the... Um, uh, community activists, and some of you hopefully would be the public representatives of, of tomorrow. So what I would say is sit back and listen, uh, enjoy. I hope that today's conversation will help everybody, young and, and, and older, I'll say, uh, to think about uh, to, you know, your own role in this, you know, to formulate your own thoughts, to, to think about your own opinions in relation to the role of women in political life and, and the huge democratic deficit that we have in that regard, and to think about your role going forward in trying to promote and ensure that there are more women uh, coming up through the ranks. Um, and I think it's exciting that we have, as I said, so many young people here today, because you're the ones in the generations or the years to come and the decades to come who re really, I hope, and I'm, I'm absolutely sure, I'm a 15-year-old daughter of my own, and I know that you know, you will be uh, hopefully, you know, harnessing your power and harnessing your capacity and your intellect and your potential to really strive and fight every day. You know, every day fight for equality and every day make sure that your voice is heard and that the, the voice that the voice of diverse groups across the country and across County Clare is heard. Okay, so that's what we're here today. I'm delighted to be able to facilitate. Um, just a couple of housekeeping things. Um, this is being recorded, so the speakers will be recorded rather than the audience. So just to say that we're very conscious that there are minors in the audience, so we won't be recording or taking photographs of the audience, but we will be recording the actual speakers. In terms of the agenda, I think you all have one in front of me, yeah? So you'll see that we have um, a lot to get through today, actually. Um, we will be hearing from See Her Elected. Uh, this event has been... Um, organized in collaboration between Clare County Council and See Her Elected. So it's great to have uh, Dr. Michelle Meyer here today, who will be talking to us around, around, around why this is important. Uh, our our here lock, uh, PJ Ryan, will be here to wish us well on our way. And then we're going to get straight into the first panel. The panel discussion uh, with our first cohort will be with uh, politicians uh, and all the elected representatives from Clare. So I'm looking forward to getting into it uh, with them. Uh, we'll then talk to uh, Madeline Taylor Quinn, who uh, is a real uh, grand dame, I think it's probably fair to say, of, of politics in Clare. Looking forward to talking to her. And then we'll talk to a group of women from diverse backgrounds about their experiences of community activism and, and uh, poli political activism. Um, we'll go on to hear from Megan Riley uh, from Women, uh, women for Election, which is another national body. And at that point then, and this is where ye come in, it's over to ye, okay? So we're doing a question and answer. There will be a mic going around 
and we're hoping that for the first couple of hours you'll think about the sort of issues that are important to you, you'll think about what you're hearing and maybe jot down a couple of notes um, and we will be uh, then handing the mics over to you and hopefully that we'll have some interesting questions from the audience and maybe keep our, our panellists on their toes in terms of uh, some of the things that you'd like to ask them about. And we'll be closing then again with Michelle from Sierra Elected to talk about the next steps from here. Okay, so I think that's it. Have I forgotten anything? No? Okay, great. So to start, folks, I am going to uh, hand you over to Dr. Michelle Maher. So Dr. Michelle Maher is the manager of See Her Elected. See Her Elected is a national organization that has a remit to get more women from uh, rural areas involved in local politics. Um, Michelle herself is a powerhouse of a woman, is a total <laughs> leader in this area. Um, and I, you know, I've always found that Michelle is inspirationally determined in her role to try and ensure that the voice of rural women is heard in, in politics. So I'm going to hand you over to Michelle now, and Michelle will talk to us about why this is important. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm going to go in behind you, Michelle. Sorry, out of your way. Thank you very much, Sinead, okay. and also to Noli. And I'm suddenly petrified after two years of looking at little squares on a Zoom screen and saying, you're on mute to, to find myself in front of a group of people is actually suddenly quite daunting. Um, but nevertheless, I'll, I'll proceed. And one, the very first thing I wanted to talk to you about today was actually democracy. Now, don't tune out, because I know it's one of those big words that you hear in, in politics, but we all have a sense that when we hear about democracy, that it's a good thing and it's worth protecting. And as we see in the Ukraine, it's, it's worth fighting for. But I wanted to kind of take a step back and think, ask you to think about what underpins, when we're talking about democracy, what underpins that, and what underpins this idea of representative democracy, where we elect people to represent us and our views and what's important to us. And the idea underpinning representative democracy is that somehow it should produce a body of people or a group of people that look like us. So if we take a look at Clare County Council, the elected representatives on Clare County Councils, and, and judge them by that most uh, basic of democratic principles, uh, what would we find? Well, if we start with the population of County Clare, it is 49.5% 49 male, 50.5% uh, female. I don't know if that's good or bad news to the, the population here. Um, and if we draw on the ethnic and cultural backgrounds, I'm taking all this from the, the 2016 uh, census, um, the biggest group identifying themselves as other than white Irish are people from the UK, people from uh, Poland and travellers. So we have 28 county councillors on Clare County Council. So if they looked like the people they represented, what we should see is we should see 14 men and 14 women. At least one of them would be from the UK, at least one of them would be from Poland, and perhaps maybe one of them being a traveller. And that 2016 census also tells us that over 13% of the population of the country um, uh, stated that they have a disability. And while there's no official estimate of the LGBT plus community in Ireland, uh, the Aractus Library and Research um, Service tell us that it's somewhere between 3.8% and 7% of the population may identify as such. So if Clare County Council was, was typical, um, then three or four of your county councillors would be disabled and one or two of them would identify as LGBT+. I may be labouring the point here and I fully accept that, but I think it was important to lead with that to set the context for what you're going to hear here today. And I actually just want to say something about Clare County Council itself first, because I think we can also be quite, we can be quite quick to criticise all our different levels of government. And I said this on Clare FM yesterday, and I just want to reiterate it here today. Um, I, I actually think credit where it's due to Clare County Council. They've recognised that there in the elected representatives, and it was great to hear from Nolene about the number of women in senior positions there. Um, they've recognised that their council has a serious gender imbalance, it lacks diversity, and they want to do something about it. So they're starting that conversation here today with all of us. Um, and it's quite an honour for See Her Elected to be associated with Clare County Council in this, because I think the council are really stepping forward here as leaders. Um, because what we have here is not just a once-off kind of box-ticking exercise. And we can see that, ha you know, you, I think perhaps a lot of us may have already been there. You go to a big conference and everyone's saying, 
we need more women, we need to do something about it. And then everyone kind of disperses and it's almost like a box has been ticked and, you know, well, she wasn't that great, but now it's out of the way, let's all go back to normal. So Clare County Council were quite clear that they didn't want that to happen. So they actually have a pathway out of this conference with uh, See Her Elected that I'll be back at the end to, to tell you about. But for now, I want to say thank you to Clare County Council uh, to Nolene and her staff, and I'm, she probably won't be very happy for me to do so, but I'm actually going to uh, thank Mary McMahon as well, who has been instrumental in, in making today happen. Um, a little bit about who see her elected are, or she for short, and you know that allows me to make that little joke, which my kids hate, about when we are successful at having more women than men, and it has to become see him elected, we won't even have to change our name. But... Um, some of you here might know the Clare Women's Network that Elaine Dalton will be talking to you about later, uh, recently renamed the Women's Collective Ireland. Well, two of their sister organisations up in Donegal and Leitrim got together with a women's organisation in Longford called Longford's Woman Link, Longford Women's Link. And they decided to look for funding to set up See Her Elected. Why did they do that? Well, the 2019 local elections had just happened one woman got elected to Longford County Council, three women got elected in Leitrim, and four women got elected in Donegal. And they were looking at these figures that had been returned in the area they were in, and then looking to Dublin, where, like Dublin City Council, half of the councillors are women and half of them are men. And some of the surrounding counties, you look at Kildare or Louth or Meath, about a third, some of them 40% of the councillors there are women, and then looking back at themselves, and they, they could see that something had to be done to try and change things in rural Ireland. So see her elected were given a remit through our funding that's about getting more women onto county councils in rural Ireland. And it's as simple as that. We started off in 2020 with great plans for the Northwest and Midlands that was going to involve me in the car going out and chatting to women. Um, and then we ran slap bang like everybody else, into COVID. So we had to move everything online in what we called She School. And that in turn, of course, meant that it didn't matter where you were in the country. Uh, you could join in no matter where you were. Uh, you could join in with our political education that sets out to demystify local government, listen to our women learning from each other about running for election, uh, learn about what it means to be a councillor from women doing the job, as we're going to hear about today, and our dedicated practical workshops that will take you from wondering how could you get involved in an election campaign to help a woman get elected in your area to perhaps being that woman yourself. And uh, as I said, the demand was there right across rural Ireland for what we're doing, and we're, we're, we're happy to recognise that and really delighted to be here in, in Ennis today. So our focus is, is on rural Ireland. So how bad is it in rural Ireland? Well, pretty bad is the answer. So let's look at Clare County Council again. Um, and I'm just dealing here with the statistics around the council itself, not the urban district councils or town councils that might have preceded them. Um, so what do the election results tell us? Well, first of all, it was 1979 before women were elected to Clare County Council when one Madeline Taylor, as she was then, and Patricia McCarthy were elected. So 1979, so just let that sink in for a minute. You know, we were able to send people to the moon before we were able to get a woman onto Clare County Council. And I suppose since then, and excluding co-options, you know, and co-option is where a seat changes hands midway between elections. For example, Donna McGettigan joining the council uh, following the, the death of Mike McKee. There's actually only been another seven women in total elected to Clare County Council, so nine in total. And sadly, that figure of nine women ever elected to Clare County Council it's a pretty average and it's better than some. For example, there's only ever been six women elected to Leitrim County Council. And I don't know how you feel about hearing that figure of nine. I was so incensed that I actually sat down and I got a list of all the men who had been elected since 1979 and I counted them all up to see how many men had been elected over the same period of time. And the answer is 96. So just picture that, again, something else, especially the younger people who will be voting in 2024, just to get that picture into their heads. So the men elected to Clare County Council, since a woman first made that step, they could field six full hurling teams, 
they would have a sub each and the woman wouldn't even be able to put a team together between them. So even if you've never thought about politics before, you've never thought about women and the lack of women in politics, you would have to say that doesn't sound right at all. So why does this matter? Why are there programs like See Her Elected? Why are there organizations like Women for Elected, whose training manager, Megan Riley, you're going to hear from later on, and a very welcome attendee today. Why are Clare County Council taking action? Well, you, you heard me talk about democracy, and um, now I want to talk about the decisions that Clare County Council take, and more specifically, who is in the room when those decisions that affect the lives of every single one of us here, who's in the room when those decisions are being made? Now, I'm not for one minute suggesting that male or female, gender fluid, whatever, the councillors in the room have anything other than what they believe to be best for the people of County Clare at heart when they're making decisions. But we all have our own mindsets, and those mindsets, they're shaped by our lives. So how we see a problem and how we might understand the best solution to that problem will depend on our expect on our perspective and on our experience of living our lives here in, in County Clare. So kind of leaving aside all the, the academic uh, arguments around this and kind of turning to common sense, a council where all bar four of them are white Irish men is missing a massive chunk of valuable expertise when it comes to assessing a problem and coming up with a solution. It's missing the expertise and the knowledge of women. And it's an expertise and a knowledge acquired not from studying, not from going off and studying degrees in politics. It comes from women living their lives here, raising their families here, caring for others. And we know that there is that enduring, persistent pattern of women doing that bulk of unpaid caring work within families. So when a council is sitting down to plan and to make decisions, they shouldn't have to guess um, how women will be affected or how their plan might play out differently for men and women. They should know because half of them should be women. And this isn't about men being better than women, uh, women being better than men. It's about getting the right combination so that you're getting those perspectives and the decision making is more rounded. I'm almost finished, whoever's keeping an eye on the time there. But I just wanted to, to kind of, again, to plant that picture in the minds, especially I'm going to say to the people who are voting in 2024, if this was the other way around, would the men of County Clare stand for it? If there were 24 women and four men in that council chambers making decisions about the people of Clare and the businesses of a County Clare, might the men of Clare, and you'd have to say quite justifiably so, say, well, actually, what about us? We, we live here too, and we have something to say. And, you know, if you want to make decisions in there, what we think might be important for you to know. And that same argument goes for having a diversity of people on the council. You know, bringing in the experience of perhaps having moved here from a different part of the country or a different country, finding yourself somewhere where you're in a different culture and you have a different ethnicity, or being a young person navigating life in, um, in Clare, or with a disability, or perhaps bringing the perspective of travelers into the council, or of people bringing a really strong feminist analysis into council decision making. Think of the value of the learning from each other that could happen, of all of those people with all those different backgrounds forming the decisions and working towards a common goal for County Clare. So um, I'll be back later on to tell you about the plan that we've developed with the council uh, for a path out of this conference um, into starting. We start off with you know, um, helping you learn a little bit more about your council, how it's structured, how the decisions are made, and about the job of a councillor. And we'll offer the pathway out of that. And, um, we have a stand in the foyer at half time, at half time. See, I'm a football fan, that's what I call it, half time, at the break. Uh, so, uh, and you'll be very willing to talk to myself and my colleague, Mairead, who's here. So for now, I'll leave it at that. So thank you all very much. Okay, everybody. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Michelle. That was, um, that was really great, and it really kind of sets it in context for us, doesn't it, uh, in terms of the really stark statistics um, and information that we have around that really, uh, the level of imbalance, I suppose, that there is 
um, not only in Clare County Council, but in the Doyle, and as I said before, in all the decision-making structures, really, of the country. So we're going to move on, actually, to our panel now. We, uh, so Carheerlach PJ Ryan has been slightly delayed, so hopefully we'll, we'll be able to talk to him later. So we're going to go straight through to the panel discussion. So we are delighted to have all the current elected representatives uh, from Clare with us today. Um, and I'm going to invite you all up onto the panel now, please, if you wouldn't mind taking your seats. So we have... Um, we have Councillor Anne Norton, who's the Mayor of Venice. We have Councillor Mary Howard. We have Councillor Co uh, Claire Colloran Malloy. We have Councillor Donna McGettigan. We have Deputy Violet Anne Wynn and Baby Collins. Um, and I'm not too sure, do we have Senator Roisin Garvey with us? No. Okay, so listen, Roisin may join us. Would be great if she could. Um, and we, we'll, we'll, we'll head off, I think, if that's okay. I'm just going to grab myself a bottle of water, if that's okay, before we do that. I had a bottle of water. Sorry. Do you want a glass? Yeah. I had a bottle of water, but it got squished underneath the seats when they fell over there. So, um, okay, so, thank you. And if if, um, if Senator Garvey, uh, Roshi Garvey is here, maybe she could just take a seat when, uh, if she's available. Okay, so folks, let me put down all my notes and all that sort of thing here. So you're all very welcome, ladies. Thanks so much for coming. Great to be here with you today. Uh, so we have a half an hour discussion, uh, and we're going to talk about your experiences as, as elected representatives for Clare, uh, and have a chat around, I suppose, the kind of challenges uh, that you've experienced, um, you know, what kind of uh, opportunities and, and um, um, help, I suppose, you've got along the way, what kind of supports have been there, and crucially then picking up on some of the stuff that, um, Michelle talked about there, what do you think can be done to ensure that the voice of women is more equally represented uh, in Clare County Council? Okay, so I'll start with a general just round of introductions, if that's okay. Um, and if you wouldn't mind just uh, introducing yourself and, and telling us a little bit about yourself, I'll start yourself, Claire. Uh, thank you. Good morning to you all. Um, my name is Claire, Claire Collar and Malloy, and I'm a councillor of Fianna Fáil, party uh, affiliate, affiliated. I'm here in the Innes Municipal District and I was elected initially in 2014. Thank you, Claire. Hi, um, good morning to everyone and it is great, fantastic to see so many young people here today. Um, so my name is Violet Ann Wynne and I'm, I was elected in 2020 as the TD for Clare. I'm now independent. Great, thank you. Hi everyone, I'm um, Sinn Féin councillor in the Shannon Municipal District. My name is Donna McGettigan and I was co-opted onto the seat after the death of my friend and colleague, Mike McKean. Um, good morning everybody, um, my name is Anne Norton. Um, I am the City Mayor of Ennis um, Municipal District. Um, I represent the Ennis MD and I'm independent. <coughs> Sorry, my throat. Good morning, everybody, um, especially for Kilroshin and the Steinen. Uh, where is it? I've forgotten. Is it just those two places? There's uh... Oh, my Kiki! Oh, you're very welcome. Um, they, my name is Mary Howard, and I am elected to Ennis Municipal District, and I started my political career back in 2009 when I was elected to the old Ennis Town Council and I've been elected to NSMB over the last two elections. Great, thank you, Mary. Okay, so just checking, can everybody hear us all right? <coughs> the sound isn't great. Okay, so we might get the mics moved in. Thank you for that. And if that, you, you might just shout out again if that, uh, can you hear my mic okay? Yeah, yeah cause I have, a, I have a mic on. Okay, great. Okay, is that okay? So we'll 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 keep going, and hopefully that'll be a bit better. Okay, so great. Thanks very much, everybody. So I guess let, let's have a chat about first of all about um, you know I guess what's motivated you to get involved in politics. Um, you know where did you start? What was the spark for you? Um, and in the context of some of the stuff then that Michelle would have talked about in terms of that imbalance, did some of that play into your thinking around why you wanted to get involved in local politics? Yeah. Um, if you'd like, I'll jump right in. Then. Yeah, thank you. Please do. Um, I suppose growing up as a, a young girl in a very large family, uh, I was always interested in observing politics, and we would have been Fianna Fáil voters, but we were never out there actively involved in the organisation. 
And so I never thought from, for, for the world that I'd be sitting as a politician here at this stage in my life because I went through various machinations as a, a, a teacher, a professor, and an attorney, and a solicitor, a barrister here in this country. But then the spark, I suppose. Okay, can I hold you? I'm sorry, yeah. can I just hold you just for one quick second, oh, Roshi? Yeah. Thank you. That's all right. It's all right. We're all just having a chat. Uh, you're fine. You're good. Take your time. So, uh, Senator Roshi Gar, who's just joined us, everybody. So, oh, thanks. <laughs> so that's absolutely fine. So we've literally just kicked off uh, and we're talking about our motivations for getting involved. And I also wanted to say, actually, just that we have, do have baby Collins with us today. And so um, Violet Ann was saying that maybe, you know, if, if, if uh, Collins decides that she wants to have her say a little bit, yeah. uh, that that might be that uh, Violet Ann might just get up and start walking around and rock you, but she is mic'd up, so you'll still be able to engage in the conversation, which is fantastic. So apologies, I'll, I'll keep, keep you going That's there. okay, I won't repeat what I've said. I hope you can all hear me, but basically I've always been interested as an, um, uh, an observer in politics, but getting involved and putting your name on a ballot was a huge step for me. And it occurred almost like by accident where all my life I've been involved in volunteering work from the youth club through to Rotary organization and then the Seroptimus International. And when I returned to Ireland from my time in America, I led a national project called the Cystic Fibrosis Project. And you all know it now because we have a Cystic Fibrosis Day which raises funds for people who have cystic fibrosis. And that effort caused my sister to say to me one day, why don't you throw your hat in and get involved in politics? Now this is when Peter Fall were in the doldrums. They'd, they'd experienced a pretty bad beating in the 2011 general election. And I said, well, how do I go about doing that? And before you know it, word went out and I got an invitation from a retired senior minister to consider getting involved. But even then I knew there were incredible obstacles, uh, especially when I was absolutely convinced my, that my only opportunity of success would have been to be involved with the Fianna Fáil party, which was where I felt comfortable mm -hmm. uh, with my family background. But that involved a lot of hard work, and to the young girls here today, no matter whether you go independent or party, you have to realize that you have to put in a lot of hard work. And for me, that involved convincing people I didn't know who were Fianna Fáil members to vote for me at a convention. And so you put your name before a convention, sometimes you succeed, sometimes you don't. And I didn't succeed in the convention for the local elections back in 2014. However, I did come in as the final last choice to be added to the ticket, which I was in 2014. And so then, um, I don't want to go on now because I know we've got limited time. So if that's sufficient to answer the spark. Yeah, and I'll bring you in maybe in a minute yeah. again just to hear more about those kind of obstacles and yeah. how you kind of eventually did, you know, end up getting Absolutely. elected. So yeah. thanks very yeah. much for that. So does anybody else want to come in and talk a little bit? Mary, do you want to talk a little bit about your motivations for getting involved in yeah, politics? Um, unlike Claire, I did come from a political family. Uh, my late father had been a member of Clare County Council. And he also had been a member of Shannon Darren for about 20 years. Okay. Um, so you kind of grew up in that I sphere of politics. This, and, um, yeah. But he had been retired. And I remember at the time, um, a, the, one of my big motivations was back in 2006 and seven, ah. uh, the economy literally just fell off the side of the cliff and mm. suicide became a okay. word that nobody wants to say out loud but was happening everywhere. <laughs> Um, and also something that really, really irked me at the time was that we had a, a, a mammogram machine here in the county hospital that had been fundraised for, uh, initially by two women who, who uh, passed away from breast cancer and it was upgraded afterwards by the, the ICA and it was taken out of the room in the county hospital to paint the room and it never was reinstated, it was decommissioned. Amazing. And in the meantime, I had known a number of women that had late diagnosis, okay. which is not good. So I had kind of toyed with the idea um, of running and getting involved. Um, and then in 2009, my dad passed. And a month before the elections, we had his month's mind. And actually, Andy Kenny, uh, who I was a big fan of at the time, was at our house and he asked me to run. So I literally left running that night with a okay. week, or not a week, with about four or five weeks to go. Yeah. Um, and as I said, I haven't looked back since. But it was, you want to make a change. You want to make a difference. And you want to make a difference to people's lives that's positive and that's good and that's tangible. Yeah, absolutely, I can imagine. Okay, thank you very much, Mary. And do, can I bring you in there, yeah, maybe? Yeah. What about your own motivations and what brought you in initially? Um, again, I wouldn't be from a, a political background. Um, it was politics wasn't something that we would have um, spoke uh, about. I think, um, like a lot of Irish families, 
uh, the day you, the day that came and you had to vote, you turn around to your mum or dad and say, who am I voting for? Um, and as you're walking out the door, they're kind of telling you. So that was the way we were um, brought up. Um, and, you know, it's, it's amazing. Like when I look back, I had a huge amount of different ideas and what I was going to do when I was your age. Um, and things change. Um, and for me, things changed quite a bit um, when I had my first daughter. Um, she's now 24, going on 25. Um, and Nicole was born uh, with cerebral palsy. Um, and I realized very, very quickly that there was very little supports uh, for families, um, for parents, and very little support for the children that actually have disabilities. Um, and over the few years, uh, traveling around the country and meeting different therapists and meeting parents that were with their children. Um, and I spent a lot of time in Dublin uh, trying to get services for Nicole. Um, and I realized that I shouldn't have to travel um, and I shouldn't have to be pulling my other children with me and um, that we should be able to have some type of a family life. Um, so I became an advocate and it's funny people use that word and I it took me a long time to actually get used to that word um, because really at the end of the day I am a mother uh, fighting to get my daughter services and with that I'm trying to get services for every mm. parent and every child so um, again it was a, a, a flippant comment that was made one evening. Um, I was saying, you know, there should be more oh, services oh. for children with disabilities. The carers should be uh, respected and uh, given more support. Um, and um, someone said, oh, sure, wouldn't you be better off now running and getting your voice out there? And again, it would never have dawned on me, but... It's like everything when it actually got into my head um, it took over <laughs> um, and the 2014 elections were coming up um, and I made the decision that I would run as an independent um, I felt for myself um, that independent was the way I felt I should go um, I feel that I have uh, people that I represent um, and I wanted to be their voice so I was comfortable running as an independent um, and I know sometimes that can be more difficult but it, I was okay. happy with that and I ran in 2014 and successfully got elected um, and then ran um, again and here I am to tell the tale. So. Okay. Thank you very much, Anne. And I know, Donna, that your kind of introduction was through, as you mentioned, through a, a bereavement, obviously, of a friend. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. For you, you were, I presume, catapulted into things quite quickly then at that stage, were you? I, I was, but I come from a very um, political background. Um, my, my granny had to flee the north and move down here, so she was discriminated against the underdog up there and also when we first moved down it was the same down here for her for a while until we we became involved in the community and she always said to me the underdog doesn't have a voice be their voice if you mm. can use have a voice use it and don't be afraid to use it so i always grew up with that so but i worked very closely with with um my friend mike mckee and i got to see uh, the cold face issues that were people were having to deal with and so when it came time when, when Mike passed, he asked me himself to, to take over his seat because okay. he knew that I had worked with him, so I knew the, the ins and outs of it. But yeah, I was catapulted in. I kind of felt like when I was going in that you had to plug yourself in at night and wake up knowing everything the next day, you know. But, <laughs> and the, some of the questions I'd have to do with and I'd have to go off and research, but um, I, I've got to love it, I have to say. So it, it was good, it was unfortunate how I got here but sure it, and it when was, was that Donna 
in 20, my pastor in 2019. Okay, so it was, yes, it's the last I'm, I'm only in the council two years. Okay, now. okay, great. Okay, thank you. And uh, Roshid, I know your own journey then in, um, was it, what is, was it, I, I'm not too sure how the whole kind of uh, nomination side of it for, for the Senate works. I know it's quite technical. Were you, were you, was it quite a surprise? Were you, was it something that oh, you would be interested I, in I politics? How did you end up? Just to go back to the beginning, when I was 12, I went to the priest and asked him, could I serve mass? I'd watched, I'd watched the boys do it and get money and get off school. Okay. So I was like, I can ring the bell, I can definitely wear the frock, I can do all that. Yeah. Went up to the priest, asked him, could I serve mass? And he was like, no, only boys. And I think that sort of there seed in my head. Yeah. I was like, okay, that makes absolutely no sense. I am physically able to do that job. Why? And there was this kind of uh, injustice sowing a seed in me that day. And I sure. think, because I've been thinking about this, you know, coming today, and uh, when, when that happens to you, it kind of sends a message that is, is telling you that you're lesser than. Mm. And I suppose that's the really important thing for me is that, you know, we are 50% of the population. And yet the entirety of all the representatives we have nationally and locally are here, which is, mm. which is quite embarrassing because we have 24 men in the council and uh, Timmy, Michael, Joe, who has six in the Oireachtas. Six in the Oireachtas. Six in the Oireachtas. So that's 24 yeah. and four and six and two, which is nowhere near the 50% um, quota we need. From the age of 12, thanks to that priest, he sowed a seed. I never got to serve mass. I'm over that. <laughs> I moved on quite quickly. Good, good. Uh, then it was the, I was playing camogie for Claire, junior uh, Claire camogie team, and we were going to training sessions in absolute crappy, mucky pitches while the under 12 boys were getting Cusey Park. Okay. And I was like, what the hell? This is continuing, this thing. And yeah. then there was, uh, I was playing with basketball in UIG and we had this cadet coach who was just roaring at us like in a really kind of aggressive way. And when I said it to him, he was like, you know, suck it up. And I was like, I, look, I'm not in the army. You don't need to bellow at us. We're here to have mm. fun as well. And there seemed to be this constant kind of a aggressive, angry, pull up your socks, suck it up kind of attitude to all these issues. And I was like, well, you know, it's okay to be a woman. It's okay to have feelings and challenge things. And where is that? Where does that fit into politics? And if we look at health and housing and education, all those things, a lot of those, we are the primary carers. Yeah. Unfortunately, you know, that's, that is still the case. And mm -hmm. I suppose if you have the main people who are the primary carers involved in doing the work, but the main decision makers are slightly removed from being on the front line of all those things, Hence, we're in this situation where things aren't working very well. Sure. And when I went to the public health uh, medical uh, health service when I was pregnant, I remember being over in Ennis Hospital, sitting on a chair. There was 80 women. We had 30 chairs. And I swore to my unborn child that when he was sorted, I was running for election because nothing was going to change until we had more women involved in politics. Okay. And that's, that was, uh, that's that was it. And well. my, my okay. father had been a councillor for many years. I, was, okay. I hated politics. I was a protester, I locked on, shut down, okay. all that kind of stuff, Tried, did all that. There's definitely space for that. Yeah. But also, if you don't have women in the decision-making tables in politics, we're also missing a trick. So, but like Mary, then you had that, you, you kind of understood, if you like, what was involved, if you like, yeah. from the family perspective. That's, that's, okay. That probably helped me get elected in North Clare. You know, I was okay. the first woman and the first Green ever elected in North Clare. Okay. And then I had the impetus because I'd worked with environmental education for 14 years with secondary schools and primary schools. Okay. And I, the, the Green Schools committees were coming up with all these, but why aren't we just, oh, why don't we just, and I was like, yeah, you're right, we should be just, yeah, why do we just doing exactly. those things. Yeah. So that okay. was another impetus, you know, who yeah. is representing the young people's voices when they're, they have, we have all the solutions to lots yeah. of things. So, and it's actually something that I'm, I'm quite conscious of. And, it, you know, I'm always very aware when I'm in a room like this or other rooms that it's generally middle class white Irish people, men or women, you know. And so and, and you know, I think it's fair enough to say in terms of the, the age demographic, you know, we, we don't have younger uh, representatives either. You know, it generally is kind of older, isn't it? I'm going to hold you there just for one minute and I'm going to bring in finally Violet, uh, Violet Anne and Collins. Um, tell us a little bit about your own introduction to, to politics, Violet Anne. And of course, Collins is going to insist right now, yes. just as you're about to say. <laughs> and, uh, her say. Yeah. No, you're okay. Sure, I'll get up and. You do have a little walk yeah. around. Your mic's there. I had a feeling there. she'd wait until I was going to Yeah, absolutely. She knew, she knew when to jump in. in there. Um, yeah, so for me, I suppose. 
politics wasn't ever an option. It wasn't anything that I had ever considered. Um, I had done my secondary schooling up in Dublin and I got afforded the opportunity to do the Trinity Access program. So that allowed me to do a year of philosophy and science and then go on to um, complete my degree in Trinity College Dublin. Uh, and that was, I suppose, my main interest was, I suppose, people and learning psychology and maybe going into that kind of area. Um, but I suppose life wasn't to go exactly the way you know, you plan, and um, I ended up getting pregnant and um, moving to County Clare. Um, and I suppose, you know, I went from the city where, you know, buses were outside your, your doorstep every few minutes um, to then living rural where it was completely the opposite, I suppose. There was only three buses at the time. Um, and it was very difficult, I suppose, to manage a young family. Um, and my partner had a neurological condition as well. Um, so I suppose I was the, the head of the household. I was managing his health issues and, and all the medications that he was ultimately being put on by neurologists and testing and all the difficulties that came with, I suppose, him going through that process. And then at the same time, having a young family um, with you know very limited transport. So for me, it was a dark time just in the sense that I felt I suppose quite alone and isolated, and I was doing my partner's head in, <laughs> giving out about the you know access to services and just how difficult it was to get out and about and get around and to even attend great services like um, the Children Early Intervention Service. So one of my children, I now have six, and mm -hmm. um, my third born uh, was ultimately diagnosed with autism in 2017. But even, I suppose, you know, being able to attend those services, which are predominantly in Ennis when you live in Kilrush or rural Kilrush, was extremely difficult. And um, I suppose I just didn't want others to have to go through those experiences. And instead of looking inwards as to what was happening for me on a daily basis and, and giving out, I decided to try look outwards. And that's when I, you know politics became an outlet for me. Um, it became somewhere that I could go to get a break from what was going on at home. It also, I suppose, connected me to very inspiring people. Um, such as the Clare Women's Network, being able to, you know, just take that time to sit on the couch and speak with other women, but also to hear their stories and, and, and to realize that, you know, we all have um, differences and difficulties and challenges. And, you know, there is a great sense of, I suppose, power and strength in being able to come together um, and to just freely talk about it and support each other and empower each other to to want better, to want change, and mm. to want to be part of that, but also to feel that you have the ability to um, you know, give other people voices as well as even speak in your own. Um, so yeah, politics was definitely okay. you know, very important. Yeah, I think <laughs> what's me. interesting for me all, just listening to you all there, you're all clearly very motivated by issues around social justice, by you know, inequality. Uh, you know, access to services, all that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, I, I would, I think it's interesting that you're all coming at it from slightly different perspectives. And again, I'm thinking of people in the audience today who might be thinking about getting involved or wondering, you know, is it a big jump? And I think what you're saying is that, you know, it, it's a case of jumping in, going for it. I presume there are huge challenges along the way, but great supports as well. Can you tell me a little bit about the challenges? And do you think that as women, in politics, uh, you know, there are specific challenges that you face and what kind of supports that are there for you? Uh, Roshi, I, sorry, Claire, uh, Claire uh, yeah. yeah. Um, no, I'd be delighted to jump in there because it was kind of, it's almost like a follow on from where I left off, which mm. is once you make a decision then as let's say somebody who isn't known in political circles such as uh, Mary and, and Roisin would have been because of their backgrounds, but you, you then have to have a lot of self-belief to overcome these obstacles that are going to appear. Mm. And, and the one thing I want to say as a side is I, I hear and talk to a lot of both male and female who believe that by way of study, let's say if they get a master's in political science, that's, that's a route to elected office. 
It will help, but it is not a route. The route is a hard grind. If you're going to go within a, within a party apparatus, you have to work within that apparatus, which means you have to talk to strangers to convince them that they're worthy of your vote in a convention. Okay. Very different now for, for Anne, who went independent, not party. But these obstacles then, in my case, when I decided to do that in 2013, you look at the list of Fianna Fáil members and you see they're predominantly male, first and foremost. Mm -hmm. And if there are female members on that list, they're likely there as the wife of, spouse of, okay. uh, the, the, the male, because the, the, the males have been predominantly, <laughs> and naturally through history, have set up these parties and they're the predominant, you know, um, uh, per, uh, activists. Mm. So in order to do that, then you really have to work hard. And that's the one thing I would say, if you're interested, the rewards are definitely worth it because when you do represent people, and as, as Violet Ann says, when you can be the voice of people who are voiceless or the mm. underdog, as as um, as Donna McGettigan has said, uh, you do get a great sense of reward from that if you can be that voice. And okay. so, uh, from my perspective, the obstacles were to get over that, to, to convince these people. And thankfully, I got there, but sure. don't expect it to be handed to you. Okay, so you have you know, to really do the convincing. Absolutely, and yeah. Kind of jump in there, punch yeah. above your weight almost. And, just, and it's something that I always say to my, ki my kids, is feel the fear and do it anyway. Just but jump can, in. But before yeah. I let somebody else in, can I just say something about what I think we'll get to eventually, which yeah. is the gender quota issue that's coming up now in the local elections and, mm. and the next general election. And I want to put it out there that I have faced criticism from very close family members as to whether that's appropriate or not, these gender-based quotas. I fully defend them. I believe they're a necessary stopgap to get us to that 50 percentile within the bodies such as the council, the Senate, or the Dáil. Yeah. But I would actually go further. I think we should be doing more. Because I know I ran in 2016. I was the only female on the ticket. I didn't want to go. I didn't believe I could win. Okay. But I was kind of really encouraged to go. Mm -hmm. So my belief is we should push that gender quota even further. We should be talking about electoral quotas. And that's very contentious. Just that's very contentious. That's like affirmative action for female politicians at all levels. Until we get to that, let's say, cohort okay. that will be that will be the role model for the students that are here today. Okay, and what we might do is just in the question and answer session, pick up a little bit more on that, mm -hmm. electoral quotas and on, on gender quotas. Roshi, did you want to come in in terms yeah, of challenges or some, what you think needs to be I done? I think there's some myths that has to be busted. I actually believe every single girl in this room could go in and take a seat at the council or the Senate or the Dáil right now today. Yeah. If you can do a junior search or a leaving search and argue three points and write an essay, you are just as capable as most politicians. Let's be mm -hmm. honest about it. And that's not... That's put myself down as well. It is not as highbrow or as uh um, I just want to come in there though. I'm not suggesting that there's a lack of no, competency no, no, no. here. I'm suggesting that there are um, I wasn't referring to what you were saying at all, actually. So. There are bureaucratic <laughs> difficulties. I was gonna say this anyway. What so I'm I think, saying is yeah. I think it's important that people realise that everybody here is capable of being a politician. Sure. Yeah. It's not as amazingly skillful as people think. And that's been a big learning curve for me from my first day in the council okay. to my first day in the Shannon. It's like, okay, this is not like that. Intimidating. Like, okay. it's intimidating because you meet people because you're like, oh my God, I've become one of them. Yeah. <laughs> but one of them isn't that hard a thing to be, to be. You know, if you have a voice and you can debate a couple of points and you can always just prep beforehand, you know, don't think that we all know everything all the time. There's a lot of prepping just as you're going in the door. So let's be realistic here. And that was a big one for me the first day in the council chamber. I was sitting there after the first meeting going, Okay, this is not that difficult. Okay. I always thought that if I got it, I'd be like, oh my God, I'm going to be showing up. I have no yeah. idea what I'm talking about or why I'm here. But what we need in politics is real people with real heart who really care. And so you're better off not being the whole, I better prepare to be a politician thing. Just be yourself. And we need people, we need all of you to get involved and to step up because if we don't, we'll never, to mind your quotas, we'll never get them. And don't believe you aren't capable. You already could do it right now. We had Corlin and Ogin we could all have learned lessons of them, you know. Yeah, and I think maybe just to bring it some of the other panellists, that there is something about being, you know, the expert of your own life, your own lived mm. experience, and that that kind of, you know, that kind of community development principle of, you know, the expertise being in the room, that you're the expert of your own life, and that you don't need to have qualifications or anything else, that is about bringing your own voice. Do you want to talk a little bit, Mary, about, you know, kind of the challenges and how you overcome them, or, or you know, what needs to be done to support more women? Well, you do, I suppose. You need to be a master of all things as well, you know, but you learn that by empathy because when people come to you with an issue that I would be totally unfamiliar with, okay. totally unaware with, I'll sit down with them and say, right, explain to me what the problem is and let's see how we can resolve it. Okay. So that's the way that I operate. So the, the, 
I suppose it, the, the question initially was, what kind of route do these people, these young people take if they're considering mm. um, getting involved in politics? And I would say, well, certainly get involved in your community. Yeah. Um, the party line is not the be all and the end all. The, the, you know, that I think you need to prove yourself. You need to be someone who will solve problems, deal with issues, deal with them head first. Um, and just, and I think that's what women do. We are problem solvers. Mm -hmm. That if somebody presents an issue to, to you know, a man in my country, I know nothing about that, though, you know. You know, that's not my area. Mm. And maybe pass you on. Whereas we will say, right, tell me about it and how do you solve it. Okay. So, um, you know, and it's all about community. I'm, like, I think we come from an amazing community. I love my town. I think we come from the nicest county in the world. I There's agree. nothing like County Clare. Yeah. Um, and I think Ennis is a great town. I hate hearing people knock it. Mm -hmm. I was born, bred and bought here. I think it's just a fantastic place. And I'm very, very involved within my community. Okay. And I enjoy doing it. And I think that's a very important pathway for anybody who is considering, you know, getting involved in local government, particularly in the future. Okay. And, and, and there is a boys club. You know, let's call it. Mm. We don't have the networks that men have. We don't have that big, strong GA club network we don't have the golf club network um and and you know the men do 24 men in clare county council four women that's not a good statistic sure and they do support each other there's no point saying listen it's all lovely and rosy in the garden yeah you know that there is the, 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 that male support network is very much there like even um you know what i find very frustrating mm. is meetings meetings are organized a lot of time in the evenings so i'm saying can we go early in the morning um, I don't have children, but if I did, it would be a huge obstacle to get them involved in public life. Um, one of my big bugbears, and I see Jim up there in the, in the audience, was with Fina Gale. They say the meeting is 8 o'clock in the oven. You go in at 8 o'clock, the boys are all having a pint in the bar. Mm -hmm. Now, this is prior to COVID, mind you. And they might come in until <laughs> 20 to quarter to 9. Sure. And they'd be scratching themselves, and the be next the meeting might start, and you get to the agenda. And it, it, I don't know, but... It, The one good thing about COVID is that when we started doing meetings online, we stuck to the agenda. And that's really that made the magic it, yeah, about it. Yeah, yeah. And can I, can, do you mind if I just yeah. bring you that, if that's Absolutely. okay? And can I ask you a little bit about what do you think needs to be done? Um, so, so Mary was saying that, you know, things like even just hybrid meetings, being able to meet online, definitely it brings a little bit more efficiency with it. What do you think needs to be done uh, to support more women to get involved, do you think, in local politics? Um, well, I think one of the very positive things that has um, been introduced over the last number of years is Women for Election. Okay. Um, it, it is an organization that actually supports women um, through local elections to the Senate and um, running um, for the Dáil. Um, and because I was new to politics now, I would have been very much out in the community and I would have been very aware of uh, what was going on um, in a lot of different elements. But when it came to the political element of it, I wouldn't okay. have been very aware. I would have been green very much so, as in not, not, not sure of pol politics. So uh, I actually went and looked for help. Um, and I uh, went and contacted Women for Election um, so that I would have a network. Okay. Um, and that I would have the support that if I actually needed um, questions uh, answered, down to the most basic things like how to even have um, your um, flyer uh, printed. So the practical uh, for, kind of stuff you know, around for the, election, the media and stuff um, like that. What type of information? Because you, you in your head, you know, you want to give as much information as possible because you're going to people that you might never have known, they know nothing about you and you try to give them all this information um, in a small pamphlet mm. and you're bringing it, getting it down smaller and smaller all the time. Um, but um, I'm a firm believer that um, if, if you want something, you have to go after it. Um, not everything's going to come to you easily, um, but you might not appreciate it if you get it too easily. Okay, um, and, and I think and what I you're think saying you is to draw it. on the supports yeah. that are. So yeah. I know you've mentioned women for election. We obviously yeah. have, have to, senior elected as well. You have to work well. with as many people as possible um, and listen to what they have to say. Um, get advice, um, 
from, you know, people that are in different areas of the community. Um, and again, not everything they say you're going to agree with, but this is what you have to learn. You need to listen to what people are okay. saying and you need to um, understand that you have to listen and then you have to decide, okay, which way am I going to go or what way am I going to do things? But there is, there is I think now there is more support for sure. women to get involved in politics. Um, we need a lot more um, support. We need a lot more um, people understanding why women should be um, in politics and what difference we and can And that's make. why events like this are so important, really, isn't absolutely, it? And absolutely. And I'm just, I'm going to ask actually Violet Ann and Donna now. Unfortunately, you know, we're, we're short on time um, and I'd love to talk to you, to you all. There's so much more we could talk about. But I, I am interested and, and I'm going to just keep the conversation going for a couple of more minutes. And I know there are people telling me the time uh, is at a premium and we're just checking around me here. But can I just ask you both? In terms of kind of tips and advice, and what, what would you say to the people in the audience today in terms of uh, getting involved in politics and what kind of supports are needed? I'll start with yourself, Donna. Um, definitely believe in yourself, as, as Roisin said earlier. I didn't sit my leave insert, so you know I can sit in the planning um, meeting and it would go over my head. But like Anne said, just ask the questions. There's, there's planning in there, the county development plan recently was a big thing. And sure, I haven't a notion about the acreage of this and the infills and the outfills, mm. and the, but asking questions. Once you believe that you can ask the question, use your voice, then you know you, you can. I mean, I, I went back four years ago and sat my leaving certain maths and English Good just for, for my son's reasons. But, you know, as Motion says, you don't need to be highly, um, highly educated, which I'm not, but you need to understand, listen and talk and ask the questions. And that's, once you believe in yourself, you can do anything. Yeah, great. Thank you, Donna. And Violet Ann, how about yourself? I mean, the fact that you're able to join us today uh, in terms of, you know, and, and being, I think it's absolutely fantastic. And even just being here today and being able to model a conversation where we have a little baby with us. And, you know, it's all very, you know, there's no big deal, no big drama. Like there would have been a time when that wouldn't have been, you know, a political representative coming to a meeting with the baby in tow would have been seen to be entirely on, you know, inappropriate. But, you know, times are changing, thankfully. Um, what would your own views be around that kind of changing world that we're in now and kind of the challenges? And, and I suppose finally, you know, the advice you would give to people around as a parent or, you know, from your own perspective? Yeah, well, thankfully, she's gone to sleep. <laughs> so, um, yeah, no, that's that's good. Um, and I think it is, it has been difficult, even the transition with a large family going into politics um, when you're not from that background and, you know, then, you know, having another baby as well on top of that. And, you know, legislation isn't there for maternity leave um, at the moment. Mm -hmm. And it's not there even for local councillors either. So, I mean, that has been, um, a, I suppose, a eye opener for myself because I wasn't aware of that. Um, and, and, you know, it, it was disappointing to learn it because just because you're maybe pregnant or having another baby or, you know, you have young children, it doesn't mean that you're any lesser capable of, of doing the job of being able to hear people, being able to engage with communities and um, listen to and, and actually have that lived experience as we've all, I suppose, outlined. And, you know, what you bring is enough um, and, and who you are is, is just as important as anybody else. Um, for me, the tips and advice would be that not to listen to anybody who says that you can't. That's first and foremost the most important thing um, because, you know, you get a lot of pe people's opinions and a lot of, a lot of advice and, um, you know, sometimes it, it can be almost to deter you. And my advice would be to, as someone has said here today, believe in yourself, believe that you are capable um, and, that, and, and you have a huge amount of self-worth as well that you you know, you have it within you to be able to be that voice for other people to, um, you know, to listen to what other, what people's concerns are and be able to hear what the real issue is and not get caught up in, I suppose, what's, you know, some of the experience that I have so far would, would have shown is that 
some aspects of the political um, network can be very focused on votes and winning seats and portraying the perfect image, um, which you know is 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 not what politics is about. It's about representing people um, and making communities better. And I suppose. You know, we had International Women's Day there last year um, with the Disability Matters Committee, and uh, I came across a quote from Maya Angelou that you know always, I suppose, struck me. Um, so I just wanted, I suppose, share with you guys, and that is that you know you may encounter many defeats, but you must not be defeated. Great, so. thank you. And on that very positive note, thank you so much, my dad. I'm going to draw the conversation to a close. I wish we could say, uh, stay for longer and continue the chat, but I would like to th thank all of our fabulous female uh, women representatives here today. Uh, Councillor Clare, uh, Deputy Violet Adwin, Senator Roshi, uh, Councillor Donna McGettigan, uh, Councillor uh, Anne Norton, and Councillor Mary uh, Howard. I do beg your pardon. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> I'd now like to welcome uh, the Cahirla of Clare County Council, uh, Councillor PJ Ryan, who's going to say a few words um, and I think wish us well and, and reflect on some of the stuff from today. So thank you very much. A vera koriori valioratus as a genarusla. It gives me great pleasure to greet you here today in Glore and to support this event to promote gender equality and diversity in local government. It is wonderful to see the level of engagement and participation in this event, and I very much welcome all in attendance here today, particularly our students from many schools across County Clare. You are our future, and I hope you get a good insight into politics and will be encouraged to, in, to participate further. It is very important that we welcome and encourage politics from all genders and backgrounds to engage in electoral, in electoral politics to ensure that we are truly representative of the people we serve. It is well known that women are underrepresented in politics and initiatives like this, support by government, are attempting to address this imbalance. I want to congratulate all involved in today's event and to wish you well into the future. I look forward to seeing greater gender balance on the ballot paper and in the council chamber following the 2024 elections. And if, if I could just move from the script for a minute just to say a few words uh, about myself in politics. Uh, I got into politics back a number of years ago and uh, I, I, I just say this, if you don't make it the first time or the second time, do not be concerned. I lost my first election by 12 votes, my second election by seven votes. And I got the fourth seat on the third time on a, in a six-seater. So, you know, I, I, I'd I be saying to, to women here today, you know, take the chance, it's out there, put your best foot forward. If you don't make it the first one, don't be deterred. You know, make the move the second time. The other thing I would say is, you know, if you really want to become, in local, in, uh, become involved in local politics, you must start at the bottom. And that means you need to get involved with your, with your local community organizations, the tidy towns, the GA, whatever is, is local in your area, get involved with it. It is very important to be involved in your local community if you want to serve your local community. I, 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 I think that's, that's very, very important. And I, I, I'll finish on this. I genuinely believe, you know, that there's a place for a lot more women in both in our own county and in other counties. And mind you, we are not doing too bad in this county. You know, when you look at other counties, there are other counties that have no women representatives. We have four. When I came into politics, Madeleine Taylor, Quinn, Patricia McCarthy were the representatives. We then we went down to one representative. We went back up to three representatives. And now we have four representatives and four very able people and do a, an absolute excellent job for their communities. And they work well with all the male members of Clare County Council as well. I, I, I genuinely believe like, that there is, there is a, 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 an opening there and I, I think, you know, the, the women of County Clare need to grab the opportunity. They won't frighten me or anybody else. They will certainly get their place in Clare County Council if they put their name forward on, 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 the, on the ballot paper. It, it takes a bit of work. The, the, the one other thing that I, that I found uh, that I have to attribute to I've been elected to politics was to look after the elderly. 
The elderly are very, very important in, in any county. I started off putting in what we now refer to as the alarms for the elderly. And I can tell you the amount of votes I got from it was just unreal because, you know, don't forget like that most elder, elderly people have their, their, their siblings around. And if you look after somebody's mother or look after somebody's father, they won't forget it for you. And I, I, I think, you know, it, need, it needs to be taken on board. And uh, I, I, I have to say it, it done me good. And I'm sure if the ladies here all want to take it up, take the bit of advice, it's costing nothing. And listen to everybody. <laughs> like it's, it's very important to listen to everybody and take the advice. And uh, I suppose I wish you all well. Hope to see you all in the next election and that we'll, we'll have a lot more lady representatives in the next election. W one other thing I need to say before I go, and that is that governments need to step up to the mark also. They need to make it a lot easier for mothers and women to represent their communities. Because I genuinely believe at the moment there is not enough support there. You can imagine, I, I, I started this morning at 7.30, I left Killarney after the Friday Place Awards. I drove up here. I've got another meeting at quarter past two today. Like, can you imagine somebody with three or four children like trying to run around and do all that? Like, I, 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 I was lucky enough, I had my wife to look after my family, but like, I know that Mothers and women need the support, and we need to put the supports in place to support them. Okay, we'll leave that. Wheel of Bucus. Thank you very much. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, uh, look PJ Ryan. Okay, so we're going to continue, um, and I'm delighted to be able to uh, welcome Madeleine Taylor Quinn to join us. Madeleine started politics in Clare in the 70s, and um, I'm pulling the seat, actually, Madeline. I'm going to sit you there, if you don't mind. Thank you very much. So, Madeline, delighted you could join us today. Um, and I might just ask somebody to, to help out with Madeline's mic there, just to make sure that um, that we can all hear. I know Niamh is on the floor somewhere, perhaps. Um, okay, so, Madeline, thank you so much. It's very nice to meet you. I know we talked on the phone the other day, just to have a chat to get ready for this. Uh, so, uh, Madeline, just so obviously you've been involved in politics in Clare since the 70s, uh, and you really have played an inspirational role, I think, over particularly in the 70s and 80s, and in, in really advancing some of the issues um, around equality um, and social justice for women. So we're going to get on to some of that in a minute, but bring me back to the beginning and tell me a little bit about, you told me that uh, when you were 13, you decided you wanted to get involved in politics and that you kind of went for it. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, I see, um, delighted to see you all here and to see so many people here, but I'm particularly pleased to see a, a large group of young ladies from the various schools uh, around the county. Uh, you're very welcome. Last night, um, when I was uh, speaking to my goddaughter, who's 15, I said to her, I'm going to speak at a, at a seminar tomorrow and I'm going to, there's going to be a lot of teenagers there. What would you like me to hear? What would you like to hear from me if you were in the audience? Mm. Oh, she said, Madeline, how boring. <laughs> oh, listening to you talking about politics. You've got to be joking. Well, I suppose she said it would be better to be sitting in there than to be in school in an Irish, at an Irish class. Yeah. I possibly would have my earplugs in and I would possibly be listening to my music while I'd be looking at you looking rather interested, but I would be away in another world. <laughs> so I hope, girls, that you're not away in another world and that you have your earplugs out. Uh, but you're very welcome. It's great to have you here. Yes, I was 13, uh, Sinead, um, and my father, like Mary and, uh, and Roshan, was, was a county councillor, and he was going to a local branch meeting in Moyasta one night, and I wanted to go, and he said, oh, no, 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 you can't go. It's not a place for children, and definitely not a place for girls. Mm. So I was a kind of a bit of an old, I suppose a bold one, you know, and I hopped in the bike, and uh, was, I lived in a rural area in Moyasta, and looked, we drove up or cycled up the road, and went to where the meeting was on and came to the door. And when I knocked at the door, the lad said, oh yeah, have you a message for your father? No, I said, I'm here to come to the meeting. You're coming to the meeting. And you were 30, doesn't yes, that Yes, and I yeah? sat in the back of the meeting and I just listened to them talk away about this, mm. that and the other thing, as they do at branch meetings of all political parties and none, uh, which was all about local issues, roads that needed to be tarred, people that have difficulties with houses, all, all that sort of stuff. So then at least I got some sense. So that this, was your first kind of feeling, your sense of what it was going at to be a like. Meeting, yeah. at, a, yeah. at a political meeting. But I realised that in that grouping, that there was the potential, 
kind of, if you had concerns, mm. to get them brought forward to, to another level. Okay. And that's what I saw was the potential. Okay, so you could see the route for you the, the, kind of bringing issues that were yeah, important to you the, into yeah, the public the, sphere to try and resolve. Yeah, okay. It could be brought over to the manager of Clare County Council or sure. wherever, wherever. So that was it. Then it came on, uh, so there was a by-election in Clare um, and I was 16 at the time. And um, my the, in a by-election, TDs and senators from all over the country come into the county where the by-election is. And a by-election is created uh, when a TD dies. So in this instance, a TD in Clare had died, uh, Bill Murphy, and there was a by-election. So okay. I, was, I was 16 and I jokingly said to my father on a Saturday night, I'll introduce um, someone uh, to address a church meeting in the morning uh, if you want. Jokingly, I had no intention really to say the word. At that stage, I was 16 with a big mm. face of acne, uh, literally like I had chicken pox. Okay. I w I'd blush if you looked at me. And at 12 o'clock that night, he came in and he, just, he woke me up and he said, by the way, you're going to have to go to one more church and Lee's Dean Church in the morning and introduce Phil Burton to address an after mass meeting. That's where you stood up on a, on a butter box and you uh, made a speech about why they should be voting for your candidate. So I headed for one more with the, with the senator uh, got onto my butter box okay. and got redder and redder and redder as I introduced the senator and got off the butter box. That was my first and that was your public first. address. And at that stage, obviously, you were a teenager. I was and 16. Then yeah. You were 16. And then I'm going to bring you forward a little bit then. Can, can I ask you, as you were then going into your 20s and you first got elected, I think, to Clare County Council in 1979, Nine, but you yep. had been working, I know, up in, up in Dublin, I think, as a I teacher. I taught in Dublin and taught in Kiki. Okay, and what, what, what had motivated you then when you, you know, when you were in Clare and you decided, you know what, I do want to put my name forward. What was the motivations behind that for you? What I saw around uh, in the county was a huge level of inequality at a variety of levels. Okay. Um, for starters, at housing level, mm. at that stage, housing um, was, was, wasn't great by, by any means. And I saw that level of inequity that existed and the, the difference in standards of living that people had. And I thought, this is not fair. This is, there's something very wrong about this. There must mm -hmm. be something that you can actually do. And, and that's what primarily motivated me at that okay. stage. And then when I went to college in Galway, I set up a, a Fine Gael branch and then I got involved and was one of the founder members of Young Fine Gael okay. and did a lot of work to establish Young Fine Gael across the country okay. um, because I saw it as a vehicle where young people could actually bring their issues of concern to a national political party and hopefully the national political party could lift those issues onto a national platform and engage and enable and legislate like um, you've spoken about and congratulations by the way you contributions were most interesting and the interesting thing about everything that every one of them were all motivated by social equity in some level yeah, or, the, or the other absolutely. All, all the speakers and one of the issues that that you were particularly interested in at, in at the time was the status of illegitimacy that oh, yeah. young that babies had babies mm -hmm. who were born outside of wedlock as yeah. it would be known yeah. at the time I thought that we was something were, you I felt we very passionate most, about I thought we were the most hypocritical duplicitous society okay we were going in cross company to the church of a Sunday sure. and we were bell ragging the, the creator that got pregnant down the road on a Monday. And I thought, how duplicitous and hypocritical can we be? Okay. And not alone are we hypocritical, we also have legislation to actively discriminate against these innocent children mm. who for, you know, were just, just, as I said, they were born on the wrong side of the blanket at the time. Mm. Um, I mean, I thought that was really wrong. So I remember we, uh, Young Fine Gael branch in Kirosh, we drafted a motion and we sent it off to the Young Fine Gael Ardish to abolish this status of illegitimacy. Uh, which we successfully got through the Young Fine Gael Conference. And then we brought it on to uh, the, the senior Fine, Fine Gael Ardish, which is the, you know, the, 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 big, the big meeting of all the mem senior members from across the country. And we got it passed there. So that was fine. And, and that, was, that was that done. But then uh, getting, it, uh, getting legislation is another day's yes. work. So you had the motion at local and national level, uh, you yeah. succeeded, yeah. but getting it into getting it the actual, into, into, into law. Into law was yeah. another day's okay. work. So we were in, we were in oh, sorry, at this stage, um, oh yeah, sorry, in the, in the meantime I stood for the council. I'd stood for so the at door. that point you were elected then, yeah, so in 1979 you, you were elected for the council. For the county council. And then in 1981, 
was elected to the Dáil. The Dáil, okay. Yes. And at that point, this and issue of the status... In 1982, I, I lost my election, lost uh, my Dáil seat. Okay. I got elected to the Senate. Okay. And in November 1982, I got re-elected to the Dáil. Uh, so that, that was the time where there was a few elections in there the space of a couple of years, whatever it was. There were four national elections yes, in I remember 18 it. months. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. mentally, physically, and financially, we were burnt. Yeah. I mean, burnt, yeah. burnt, burnt. Yeah. But the other thing that I, I think I said to you when we were speaking... At that time, uh, the bank, you could deal with a bank manager and you could get a loan off of him. Mm. And if it weren't for a very decent bank manager, I wouldn't be in politics today. Okay. Because he actually gave me loans to fight those elections. Okay. I, had a I had a thing in principle. I, that as a politician, you cannot and should not, under any circumstances, accept money from, from people. Uh, because if you do, you are beholden to them and you are not going to be mentally free in your head, free in your mind to make decisions at all times. Yeah. In some cases, yes, but there'll be always the time when someone can say, uh-uh, yeah. you owe me, and you could be compromised. So the bank manager was really good, got the loans, the fought the elections, and was, uh, was paying, off, paying them off for the And, and you mentioned years. to me that when we were speaking that the fact that you had a permanent and pensionable job at that time, which I know you subsequently yep. gave, up, gave up, but that you could access loans. Correct. And therefore you were able to kind of financially propel yourself, if you like. And Absolutely. so that barrier was less perhaps of a barrier for you because you could manage because it. Because you could manage it. Yeah, but that, but that is a huge barrier really for women, isn't it, but going forward for election? it's a huge barrier. And yeah, now with the, the financial side of it. That level of flexibility is not there at local sure. bank managers that was available and there then and I think that's a huge hindrance uh, to women of every, at every level not mm. just people with a permanent pension but any, anybody so I think that's something that has to be really seriously addressed yeah. um, how to address it is the issue I mean I have been thinking about it should you know the local credit unions be, uh, and the local banks or, the, or even the council in some way be encouraged to provide low interest rate or no interest rate <laughs> loans to women uh, to fight an election because, because it does take money, because doesn't it? it does with all take the printing money. and the whether, travel, whether and it's the... ten euros or a hundred euros or a thousand euros, it's money. And sure. if it's money you don't have, you're you're handicapped as a result. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and that is a really serious issue that needs to be addressed. Uh, and I think it's going to involve a lot of thought and a lot of examination as to how that issue will be overcome. But what I would say is, I remember I was teaching in Kiki and I was kind of saying, "Oh my God, here I am. I'm in Clare County Council. I'm one of two women." in Clare County Council and teaching here in Kiki is this what life is all about you know where to now what, do you, what does one do mm. and I thought oh my god I, I, you know I can do so much in Clare County Council but there's only there's a limit to what you can do okay. uh, and um, you know anyway make a long story short I said right you know what will I, will I try I, I go for the door when I'm about 45 or 50 okay you know when I'm nicely settled and sure. nicely whatever and the next thing was, that didn't happen. I was approached and I was asked, would I consider standing? And I said, mm, yeah, mm, I'm a bit too young. I don't have the experience. All the reasons why not. Mm. And I was being totally and actively discouraged at home. I mean, um, my parents and didn't, under no circumstances, mm. don't get involved. Politics is dirty, particularly for women. So, um, but anyway, I decided to go. But I mean, Roisin was at our Claire uh, went down about the getting selected and going to convention mm. within a political party. I mean, that is a, that's an education uh, because you go around and you talk. You have all the members of the, the organisation across the county, and you go around and you talk to them all and tell them really, you know, I'm as good as any. You know, um, I you know I really do want to go, and this is why I want to go, and this is you know I, I can do this and I can do that and I can do the other thing, or at least I think I can. And you go around and you talk to them and what have you. And I was fortunate enough to get through on the convention, okay. but it is a challenge. It is. A, it's fact, a barrier. That's, yeah. It's a big. It's a big undertaking. Mm. Um, it's not for the meek-minded, or it's not for the, the, the sort of standing back and sort of, you know, God, you have, it, uh, you, have you just have to put your And that out. networking piece, again, that some of the elected reps would have talked about earlier, you know, that, that there is perhaps, women, I suppose, are, are not always in those kind of networking zones, if you like, in terms of the golf or the GA or whatever, yeah. or less involved, perhaps. And that, that in itself presents a barrier. Now, you obviously had politics in your family, I, I think. I had my father. So, that's yeah, so that really yeah. does help. It do, yeah. So, so, so the but kind of getting on the ticket. About that, a lot of people think that because somebody's had somebody before them in politics, mm. uh, that that is automatically when they automatically, oh yeah, grandfather them, they got it handed to them. That's okay. not the case at all. In fact, sometimes that actually causes you bigger barriers because it's just a case of how dare she, who sure. she thinks she is. Yeah. Uh, and, the, and that comes up. And there was a study done in relation to um, um, offspring of, of politicians who sought uh, to get selected in the various mm. political parties. And it's like, 
that 10% or less have actually managed, who tried, have got through the system. Sure. So, so it's, it's not an automatic right. Yeah, it's not yeah. an automatic right. Talk to me a little bit then about uh, other barriers that you feel are out there for women and that, that were there for you in, in your day as well. So we've talked about getting on the ticket is, the, is, is a barrier, financially is a barrier. Childcare, I know you had a few children yourself. A couple Absolutely. Of, yeah. 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 Childcare, and, child and uh, Mary Howard referred to it earlier, childcare is a serious um, issue because like the one thing is once you produce a child, you really are responsible for your child. Mm. And the motherly instinct of you kicks in and you're tied between, and uh, Riley Dan is her baby here today, which I'm delighted to see, congratulations. And she, you know, you're, you're tied with you wanting to mind your baby and nurture your baby mm. and, and doing your job and being responsible. So mentally you're pulled, like you are really, really pulled. Mm. Now I was fortunate, I was able to get uh, some very nice women to come in and stay in my house and stay overnight when I was in Dublin. So I was really fortunate. Sure. But that's not, not that, that, that might necessarily... That is the reality To get the, to get the suitable everyone. person. Yeah. yeah, to get the suitable person. And even, I remember my first child when, you know, I, he, I was two weeks after he was born, I got a phone call from the whip to say, there's a vote on in the doll, and we, we were in government and we had only a majority of one. So the government could fall if uh, the votes were, were, weren't there. Get a phone call. You have to be in Dublin um, tomorrow night, uh, two weeks after the baby, uh, to vote. Otherwise, the government will fall. Yeah. So, can you imagine? You're here with two your weeks. baby. Um, <laughs> you have to be in Dublin. Otherwise, the government. Can you imagine the responsibility sure. of bringing down a government because of your baby? Right? <laughs> yeah. Great. Great stuff altogether. So I remember uh, hopping in the car and driving up. To, at that time, there was no motorway from Minas to Dublin. Yeah, so it was a, a fairly long five-hour drive. Yeah, and God. getting up for the vote and saying, well, here's sons of guns. And I remember uh, going up. <laughs> sons going of guns. <laughs> <laughs> I remember going I'd say there was more words than that. But yeah. <laughs> and over to Charlie Hawhey. I said, Charlie, you're such... You know, see, they were in opposition at the time. We were going, but sorry, PJ. <laughs> sorry, Claire. <laughs> but over to Charlie Hawhey, I said, you're some... You are so uncivilized. Imagine forcing a woman after having just having a baby two weeks ago to come up here to Dublin. I said because you wouldn't provide uh, provide a pair. Oh, Madeline says Charlie. Oh, I didn't know anything about that. You'd know less. I said you knew well, 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 well. But in fairness, after that they were uh, civilized. There was a civility, and yes, um, I didn't. I, they didn't push me too hard. But on the other level, I knew that if I didn't, wasn't in there and if I wasn't involved in everything that was going on, the ground could start slipping and the sea could go. Okay, so, so that juggling was constantly going on. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. And yeah. You, were the, you, you were very involved, Madeline, in some of the uh, kind of significant social changes that came about in the 80s. And I remember them well as a teenager in the 80s and my parents, I suppose, were, weren't involved in political parties, but they right. were very interested in politics. Yeah. And I grew up in a very kind of political house without actually being connected to a party. But so... So I know with the status of illegitimacy that that actually was changed by law in the mid 80s it and was. that she kind of helped get the ball rolling with your right. with your motion at local and national level. Yeah. I know you were also on the Women's Rights Committee and the Marriage Breakdown Committee, okay. two hugely important committees yes. in the yeah. 80s. Yeah. And again, I, I would imagine that for, for people in the audience, particularly maybe younger members of the audience, you know, they're really, you wouldn't possibly just know the extent to which there was like entrenched inequality around some of those issues around, oh, you know, the, the marriage uh, the, uh, breakdown and breakdown. women's rights, like huge inequalities Absolutely. in the yeah, 80s. Yeah, yeah. And so you were chair and involved in some of those committees. Tell us a little bit about that, that yeah. time. I mean, Gareth Fitzgerald was the leader of the City Gale Party and he was the teacher at the time and he was socially liberal. Uh, and uh, he came down here to the centenary of, it was the 150th anniversary of, of St. Flannan's College. And he made this major speech and he had the bishops of Ireland almost up in uh, arms. Sure. He yeah. talked about his social crusade. He launched his social, social crusade here in St. Flannan's College in Ennis. Oh, right. And there was, uh, there, was a, there was major ripples as a result, but part of his social uh, crusade was to uh, get divorce introduced into Ireland. That sure. was one of the issues. Yeah. Right, the status and legitimacy was the other, well, was, an, was another. Uh, there was a whole lot of others. Um, and uh, then the legislation, uh, then, uh, then to, to actually go to get to the divorce level, they set up a marriage breakdown committee. And the marriage breakdown committee invited submissions from all over the country and from various people and parties to 
give it their views as to what they felt about it. And make a long story short, we got over seven, eight hundred submissions. Okay. Now, it was a really, really strong committee. You had people like Mary Robinson on it, uh, Catherine McGuinness, Alan Shatter, Porrick Flynn, who was at, at the other end of the spectrum. Sure, the more uh, conservative from, from, voice from coming voice, in. Yeah, yeah. From, 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 um, from Mayo, Rory O'Hanlon. So, and it was a committee of 15. Now, that was a really interesting committee. We did an awful lot of work there, mm. and we ended up uh, pre presenting a report which subsequently led to the introduction of the Judicial Separation Bill, which was introduced uh, into the Dáil. Now, I chaired the Select Committee on the Judicial Separation Bill, which okay. was in turn the precursor for the sitting up of, the, of, of divorce. Okay. So again, unfortunately, we have so little time. I would love to talk to you about more uh, of this, of, of all of the stuff that you were involved in. And I'm conscious that we did promise people lunch. Uh, and what I've done is I've taken the liberty now of, of if you'll excuse the pun, eating into your lunchtime. So uh, instead of having the course of an hour, I'm actually going to, give, going to give a half an hour if that's okay, because I really they wanted be to... Happy. They won't be happy with me. <laughs> no, they won't. But, uh, you know, I think it's, it really is inspirational that, and again, I, I know there'll be many of us here who will remember that those times yeah. back in the 70s and 80s, when the level of restrictions on women in terms of our, our body, in terms of contraception, in terms of abortion and divorce, you know, just right, even, even women having to give up their job when they had a baby, all of that. So you were involved in all of that and pushing it, the first woman in Clare to be elected as, as a TD and pushing that agenda on behalf of the women in Clare. Madeline, I would love if we could talk some more, but I'm really, really sorry. There's just one thing I want to say. Sure, and, please. And you know, you talk about the big things and you talk about the national things, but there was actually one thing that really, that I was really, kind of happy I did, like despite all the other bits and there are lots of other bits but there was one thing there was uh, um, the the help or the care care at one stage uh, were refused a grant to buy a property uh, where they wanted to set up an addiction center okay and there was a big objection to this property being bought by Claire care and make a long story short the department refused the grant which was to me terrible now uh, they, I went I got it brought an invitation to the minister and managed to get that decision reversed, okay. which normally doesn't happen. You don't get decisions that are made in the department reversed that easy. But we brought a deputation, we got the thing reversed, and you have Bushy Park in Innes today. Okay. And that was it. And I mean, that's just, to me, to me, that was just one thing yeah. locally uh, that has, in my view, made a huge difference. And if it weren't sort of for the commitment of Claire Care and the doggedness that I had on that issue, because I felt so bad, because I knew so many people who had addiction issues yeah. that they needed this facility. And it was, but it, 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 it took doggedness. Sure. But I say to you ladies and whatever gentlemen are there, never shy back, never stand back, keep going forward and always think positive. You're well able and capable of doing it, just do it. And Michelle, when she spoke earlier, as I was just came in, she was referring to the fact that women, did you ever think about supporting your women? I think women don't recognize the importance mm of women supporting women. And if anything else, if you're not going to be a candidate, at least support a woman candidate and at least go out and help them because they need the support. And it's to the benefit of the community. It's the benefit of everybody to get more women and more balance in society. So thank you all very thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madeline. So uh, we are going to kick off now. Have we got everybody from our second panel? Yeah, great. Listen, thank you all very much for coming back. I hope you enjoyed your, your teas and coffees and bits and bobs out there. Um, so we're going to continue our discussion now and we're going to uh, chat to a group of women from very diverse backgrounds who themselves have been involved in politics, uh, either directly putting the name forward for election or in the background, or people who are uh, involved in community activist, activism and, and supporting women in, in activist roles. So I um, would like to welcome, so our, our panel today is Bridget Casey from Clare Local Development Company, Victoria Alukadibi, have I got that right? Yeah, um, who is an Irish Nigerian. Nigerian young woman. Uh, we have Teresa O'Donoghue from Clare PPN. We have Anne Marie Flanagan, who's a local, who's a former local election candidate, and we have Elaine Dalton from the Women's Collective Ireland Clare. Okay, so actually what I'm going to do now, if that's all right, is I'm going to just ask you all to say hello and maybe just um, uh, say a little bit about yourselves and how you, um, I suppose, got to be involved in community activism um, and, and politics. So just a very quick round of introductions, I think, if that's all right. Teresa, I'm going to start with yourself. I'm Teresa Dunhill. I live How's our sound here? Is this? No, I'm just wondering if we can get. Uh, right. Yeah. Okay. So I'm in Liston Burnus in North Clare. Um, I'm mother of five. I'm an, a climate activist and. Um, 
You're on Chair PPL. <laughs> Chair PPL, yeah. <laughs> so I represent the environment. I've been representing the environment since 2009. And that's uh, on local authority boards and committees. So you're kind of outside of the local authority, but you're working inside on representing different places. So I represent the environment. Great. Thank you very much, Teresa. Go on, Teresa. Um, my name is, uh, sorry, my name is Bridget Casey, and I'm a travel manager in Limerick. Um, I work now in Clear, <coughs> Clear Travis CDP. Um, I suppose I've been involved in community work for maybe maybe over 20 years now. Okay. Um, how I got involved in community work was I, as a child woman, um, faced a lot of discrimination uh, when I grew up uh, in school, at shops, pubs, and so forth. Um, and even in hotels, like, you know, uh, being refused mm. in, in the, the hotels or the pubs and so forth. But um, I suppose a number of years I worked with travel competition mental health and um, education. And all of that, I think, was primarily in Limerick, Bridgie, wasn't it? It was yeah. in Limerick, of course. So and I, I'm just going to hold you for a minute, because so now you're in Clare, mm -hmm. and we'll hear a little bit maybe about what you're going to be doing in Clare as, as the discussion goes on. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Very nice to have you here today. I'll go on to yourself, Elaine. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Elaine. I'm the project coordinator with the Women's Collective Ireland Clare, formerly the Clare Women's Network. Um, I've been involved in activism for, um, I think, maybe 30 years. God. <laughs> and I, I started in, uh, I, I, so I've been living in Clare for 30, I'm, uh, 30 years. I'm originally from Dublin. But um, I guess my, I've always been interested in activism and politics from a, young, from a very young woman. But I, I, in, in the 90s, I separated um, from my husband and I became practically a lone parent and I was, I literally saw how I was changed, uh, how I was treated. Mm. Uh, I saw it changing overnight and um, I just was incensed by the newfound inequality that okay. I was experiencing. So that was a great driving point. And that kind of brought you in then to your... It brought me in okay. more formally okay. through... Um, Donna's par uh, partner, Noel, who's um, rest in peace, um, he was key in pulling me along. <laughs> okay. I'm, I just keep going around the panel and just finish the round of introductions and then we'll, we'll go back into all of this. Um, I'm just wondering, maybe, Nia, I just think we have a little bit of a problem with sound, so maybe would you mind just helping us uh, with mics? I don't know, you're not mic'd up. Uh, oh, you are mic'd yeah. up perfectly. Uh, and I think maybe it's just Bridgie's mic, maybe, if it was possible to just make sure we're... That would be great. Thank you very much. So I'll go on to yourself, Anne-Marie. Yeah, um, I'm Anne-Marie Flanagan. I live in Emma Steinman. I'm a mother, mental health professional, and I would identify as a community activist. And I suppose I politics was in my DNA. My grandfather, my grandmother's very much embedded in the community and social activism and women's rights. And, and, and I suppose for me, my catapult into injustice was leaving my, um, my village in Corrafane. I grew up in a housing estate and even that I was aware of. Um, I grew up in a, a working class housing estate, but my family was, I suppose, much more seen as middle class. So I, I, I could see, I could feel the difference when the Newtown children were blamed for everything. So that was sitting with me. But what really ignited my shock of what a justice felt like was when I went to secondary school. I could not believe how overnight I became invisible. I was discriminated against, but I was bullied. But what really upset me, even at nearly 15 years of age, mm. that the adults did not help the children. Okay. And that really, like, I was like, boom, this was, and so I would leave school and be Anne-Marie again. And I remember I said it at the, um, the a festival, and was 2019? Uh, yeah. Imagine, in 2019 was the first time that I was in the Donlan speaking, and I went there for five years. Okay. as a school wow. so that was really a big one and then of course you know i remember the 90s you know there was social movement gender equality the mm -hmm. rights of disabled people and so myself and dermot were involved in the care community co-op and we set up the first 
Centre for Independent Living outside of Dublin. So really, that was it. And then I went to England, came back, and I met the wonderful Dawn Lobera. And then I, I just was blown away by, I suppose, Trevor Sargent, Patricia McKenna, and that was it. I was hooked. I was running for election. And so I hope, Roshin, that I paved the way in some way because I was the Green Party candidate in 2004 and 2009. And I suppose a bit proud when the Greens were decimated, I got 8% of the vote as a disabled woman in the North Clare as a young person who hadn't, we'll say, a history of it. So, and for me, when I look back, it was climate justice and the urgency around it, but it was the just, I didn't have the language for it, but I just knew as we were going to tackle this issue that we needed to actually look at what that means for everybody, the poorest person, the homeless person, the traveler person, how do we ensure that actually everyone is involved in that conversation, but that everyone's needs are met. Okay, yeah. thank you. Well, thanks very much for coming here today. Yes. And Victoria, maybe tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, so um, can you hear me first of all? Yeah. Uh, my name is Victoria Lukatibi. I'm from Ennis, and I would say I'm somewhat of an accidental activist. Um, I got involved, kind of involved with uh, campaigns in college during my time in NUIG. I got involved with like indirect provision and repeal and marriage equality. And then after leaving college, I got involved in community work with uh, Haven Horizons and Clare Haven. And seeing like the way laws affect like uh, women and marginalized groups really kind of pushed me to get more involved in activism and try and make changes where I could. And as I went on with my community work, I noticed that there was a real gap in um, in like or a discrepancy in who was speaking. So. It was usually the same kind of person again and again and mostly men and some women very few women who looked like me so i thought like you know someone has to represent marginalized voices and uh it well it, hopefully it will only be me i i hope that um going forward there will be more people like me in these spaces right thank you victoria but listen it's absolutely great to have you all here today so let's talk about maybe, first of all, what the challenges are for women in the context of your lived experiences um, and uh, your perspectives. What are, do you think, the main challenges that face women in getting involved in politics? I mean, when you think about what, uh, you know, what, what Michelle said there earlier, only nine women in the last however many years, 100 years, I guess it is, uh, have been uh, elected to um, politics in, in Clare, which is like it's shockingly low, isn't it? What do you think the barriers are from your perspective? Jump in. Any of you? Colonialism, sexism, patriarchy, ableism, <laughs> racism. Okay. I mean, they All are these barriers. Where to um, start? It's not yeah. to say that every single one of us, as everyone has said before, shouldn't try, believe in ourselves. Um, but I can tell you, as a disabled woman, that the level of self belief is has to be so high. Like when I quest, like when for me when I was running for election. Like I was, I'm running for election in rural North Clare. So I had to sit in my car, I had to drive, get someone to knock at the door, come out. And that, even that alone mm. could have been a barrier. You know, that would be like, people were like, could have shut down. But then I had to do the additional communication and convincing and relating to people. Um, at hustings, for example, just even take that at hustings, everyone stood up when they were asked to speak and I was sitting down. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so that so I, did, I remember when I was much younger, I didn't even think of my gender because of the issues that I experienced around ableism. Okay. And remember, people, it's unintentional, a lot of the prejudice. People don't even know that they're, you know, that they, that they have prejudices, yeah. you know, and I think that is really, really difficult to challenge. So that would have been some of the barriers that I would have yeah. experienced, yeah. And what do you think then in the context of those barriers, you, you know, what do you think needs to be done in order to support more women, but more women who are disabled? into politics, what can be done? Like if you go back to your experiences and you know, going into the room where everybody else is standing up, you know, is there kind of almost some practical stuff or are we talking about significant kind of legislative and statutory stuff here or is it a bit of both? But I'm, I'm just conscious, I think there's a yeah. feedback, is there? Yeah, I don't know if, if there's anything we could do about that feedback, I think I'm well, hearing it anyway. I suppose there, for me, it's two pronged. There is informing our, con our potential constituents, the voters, 
and supporting voters to actually understand the importance of their vote. Yeah. So I would go right to the young people here. I actually think there needs to be a much more um, support of educational process, mm. whether it's at school or, or, or leading up to the campaign. And I suppose one of the reasons why I really admire and always will be grateful for Patricia McKenna is that she insisted that the commission provide you know, objective information. And I think supports like that to provide um, objective information on candidates. So we, we develop our own, if, if we're candidates, we develop our own um, propaganda, <laughs> our own information <laughs> policies and positions. And that information I think needs to be taken from us and brought through a commission that actually allows people to actually be informed around people based on agreed um, standards of what is required to be a strong representative. So you can you can be informed by the individual and our ability to communicate, mm. and then you can make your own decision. I also think there needs to be, like we have the Equal Status Act. You know, for me, there's reasonable accommodation. That doesn't apply when it comes to me putting my, um, you know, name forward um, and our other disabled people. Um, here today, for example, um, you know, we hope that there wasn't going to be a deaf person here because there was no sign language interpretation. So like, I suppose one of the things I've learned is as a disabled person, I constantly, and disabled people have to ask to ensure we're going to be included. Like this almost was a disaster because at the 11th hour we learned that the lift wasn't working. So straight away, if you think about it, if we hadn't known that, we'd have arrived, and then they'd be like, oh, and Maureen, you have to go in the back door. Straight away, people would be like, they're, they're on to the next person. It's so true. until there are processes in place, until local authorities actually put resources, processes, codes of practice that actually ensure that every person is provided with parity and mm. a level playing pitch, whether it's gender, impairment, race, whatever it is. Um, you know, I, I, I think you know, those of us who want to, um, I suppose, put ourselves forward in the hope that we'll be elected um, will be on the back foot. So there's systemic change, absolutely, yeah. without a doubt. And we really need to help. But also, we, perhaps, to me, it's about the voter. Like, as a young candidate, I was, I can't, I was in my 20s, um, in 2004 and then in 2019 or nine, and I would knock on the door and young women were still saying to me, ah, I have to wait till he comes home. And some of these were girls right. I went to school with. I said, what are you talking about? Mm. Or, you know, what, what, you know, Henry, we're, uh, if, uh, we're this family, we're that family. And, and it staggered me, but it didn't. When I look back, of course, um, the, the lack of information res information available to people yeah, to and make even informed still, decisions. I think in secondary oh, schools there's not a huge amount of, of voter awareness or political awareness done. I mean, I know mm. there is some, but yeah. I, I would have, I suppose because I now am a teenager and I'm seeing it, I would have thought there'd be more. Yeah. Definitely, I think local authorities have a huge role to play as well, don't they? And I think the mm. fact that Clare County Council is doing this today, but local authorities have have a huge role to play in building the capacity of people to understand how politics works and, and to help people to make informed decisions. Yeah. Scientism, I mean, it drives me bonkers. I'm going the to fact bring... that disabled people or people don't have their needs met as citizens and have to use a candidate or a politician sure. to have the rights that they have, their entitlements met, that actually backfoots the individual who is about policy and legislation and reform. Because while we're busy trying to adjust the system to be inclusive of mm. everyone, you have the others who are busy writing the letters, making promise, false promises. And that gives a false sense because for, like we all know, those of us who are candidates who are being successful, you knock on the door and what do people say, what, what can you do for me? And I get that now. Sure. Yeah. Teresa, I'm going to bring you in, if you don't mind. So you've been a community activist up in North Clare, I think, yeah, for a number of years, and you've been sitting on the Public Participation Network. So that's another way for people to have a say on issues that affect their lives. So through the Public Participation Network, um, you can get involved and start advocating and um, being an activist around issues that are important to you. And local authorities are obliged, if you like, to engage with PPNs. Yeah. Tell me about... Uh, where, where you think, well, where you think the PPN fits in then, you know, how can the PPN help in terms of giving the people of Clare a voice in issues that affect their lives? Okay, well, when I first started to represent the environment, it was a whole new system of bringing in people 
And there was a quota given to representation for the environment. So they all of a sudden had to look for people to come in and represent them. So now so, they, the, so the local authorities on their committees are required to have required a certain to, number was, of seats for community representatives. Well that, back, back in 2009, it was just a last minute decision. that We bring in a quota for environmental representation. Then by 2014, when they changed local government and brought in the PPNs, they allocated two seats on the secretary of the governing body for environment, two seats for social inclusion, and two seats for the community. Because before that, it was always the community that was represented because there's so many people who don't identify as environmental or social inclusion. And now, so the PPN is a, is a very... Um, solid structure of diversity. Sure. It can be. It usually is. And there's Clare. hundreds of organisations all over Clare involved. Yeah. So all of these organisations work together to bring the voices of those groups together. So it's a very good community-based um, process to get into the decision-making tables. And, and so for people here maybe that have an interest in yeah, either yeah. activism or political representation, the PPN is, can, can be one of the first steps, I think, for getting involved. It's a good vehicle to get involved and okay. see the inside from the outside. So you're not actually a councillor, you're not actually working within the um, council, but you are actually sitting at the table with the councillors, mm -hmm. you're, you're seeing how decisions are made or not. And you get an, an opportunity to bring your voice forward, because at Clare PPN we, we pass motions that all of the groups sign up to. So we, we passed a motion that we climate action was going to be our biggest agenda a long time ago, the very start, you know, we want to all sl solidly work together. And we would sit down before the meetings, because Elaine is on it and I'm Maria before meetings, where we're all going into the one meeting under a different hat, uh, the environment, social inclusion, social inclusion, and we would all discuss the points we need to bring up at that meeting. Okay. And then we can support each other yeah. at the meeting and make yeah. sure that those voices are heard. Okay, great, thank you. And we'll go, I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit more about the challenges of community activism um, in a while. Um, I'll go on to yourself, Bridgie. Now you've been, you know, a long time involved in advocacy around traveler mm -hmm. issues. Um, and you talked at the very beginning about the racism and the discrimination that you yourself would have experienced and that obviously you're, you're members of your own community. What kind of challenges do you think there are for people in the traveler community in getting involved in, in politics and, and in, in, in activism? Yeah, I suppose like when you look at it, there are no travellers in, in politics. Okay. And we have one traveller, Eileen Flynn. Yes. But she has been being pointed by the, the Taoiseach. So if she had to go for local election, like she wouldn't have, probably wouldn't have getting the votes. Yeah. Um, in the last election, there were three travel women that went for election. That's local the election. That was at, at locally or nationally? Locally. Oh, really? Okay, yeah. great. Here in Clare? Or no, no across um, the country, I presume. One in Cork and one in Longford, and I think one in Galway. Okay, okay. But the, they didn't get, they they didn't get the votes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think women, you know, travel women and secular women need to support one another. Mm, you know absolutely you know yeah uh, we need we need allies working with us yeah. in the background and the issues that women face in general you know and i think even when you look at both claire and limerick uh, or i'd be familiar with limerick you know over the last 10 or 20 10 years anyway there hasn't been dedicated traveler organization in either county i think is that right That's at correct, a local yeah. level and so when you think of that huge deficit like there mm -hmm. hasn't been a representative group there um, fund, you know, which properly funded by the state mm -hmm. uh, to ensure that there is structures and a voice. That in itself means that there are just no mechanisms for, for people Travel. from the traveller community yeah. to get involved. Yeah, mm -hmm. so it's a huge deficit, isn't it? Like, like here in Clear, there has been, never been a traveller-led organisation. Okay. But now we're in the process of setting up a traveller-led organisation to look at the issues that travellers face, especially regarding discrimination. Mm. And accommodation is a big issue within the travel community. You know, especially with travel women, children, and so forth, they have no toilets, no water, no, no electricity. Yeah. Uh, a lot of my people are living in terrible conditions. Sure. Yeah. And now that the new CDP, so it's the Traveller Community Development Project, has just opened mm -hmm. in, in, in Clare, and it's under the auspices of Clare Local Development Company, I think. That's right, correct. that's right. Yeah. It's, um, a it's a three year pilot scheme. Great. So we have to demonstrate and set up a traveller independent organisation, and that will be led by the community and directed by the community. Okay. You know, uh, we're hoping to do our strategic plan very shortly. And, that and I will, presume part of that, that is about a, the voice. That will give us a direction and where, where we go in regard to issues affecting the travel community. Okay, and will part of that, uh, Bridgie, be about you know, supporting the voice of traveller people? Is there kind of an advocacy part of well, your role? You know, absolutely, there will be. Um, also, so, uh, the organisation will hope to 
get travel leaders. Okay, great. Yeah. yeah. And that both within the traveller community, like travel women, young women, yeah. travel men, and the issues that they face on a daily, daily basis. Yeah. You know? And Victoria alluded to it there when, when you were speaking, Victoria, you said, you know, there was nobody that looked like me. And I'm sure it's the same in the traveller community where, you, where you, you don't feel you'd be proper, properly represented because there are no travellers either in politics or in <clears> local structures. And so part of what you're going to be doing over the next few years, I, I think, is trying to address some of that inequality locally and best of luck i was delighted to hear yeah, that, that, no, that, that, that the absolutely because for, for years we had settled people speaking on our behalf yeah you know um, and now for the last number of years you know we have strong travel women activists around the country the likes of bridget quilligan you okay. know uh Nancy power you know okay. there's a number of strong travel activists who have been involved in community development from the gas routes okay yeah. great well, best of luck with the whole Thank thing. You. I think it's, it's a great uh, to see it established. Victoria, I'm going to bring you in. Talk to me a little bit about, um, you know, the challenges as you see them. So you are an Irish Nigerian woman and you are a young woman. So, you know, in terms of your voice and your ability to, or your, the opportunities for you, I should say, really, to, to be part of the overall conversation around equality and women, the voice of women, what kind of challenges have you experienced or do you see that are out there in Clare? Um, so, first of all, like it's, to pick up on what Anne-Marie was saying, a lot of these structures are very patriarchal. Okay. So it's very hard to infiltrate it as a woman, as a young woman, and as a black woman, those challenges are amplified because not only is, is it somewhat of a boys' club, once again, there's no one there that looks like you. So you're kind of looked at like a bit of a... Uh, a novelty okay. now that can be a good thing sometimes but other times if you're speaking from a particular pers perspective no one there is really there can is able to back you up because that's not their experience okay now like so if you want to go for if you like thinking of running for office or for a, a council seat as a black woman one of the many fears in the back of your mind is how will people react to seeing my poster. Will my poster be vandalized? Will I be harassed? Will they, will my house be traced? And you know, these are things like, being a woman is hard enough. Being a black woman, it's, it's just going to amplify that. Yeah. Like, because not only will you get misogynistic attacks, your, your attacks will be racialized as well. So I've heard a woman who ran for council in in, I can't remember what county, and she said that she was called a monkey in the street. Her her poster was vandalized. It, you know, they compared her to all sorts of animals and things, and that's a real fear. Yeah. And Elaine, can I bring you in on that then? In terms of your organization, the Women's Collective Ireland, I don't know if I got that right. Yeah, Claire, I know you are uh, Claire Women's Network. Um, so you've been around for a long time and supporting women at a really grassroots level to, I suppose, to address and, and to fight for equality and to address some of the challenges that we'll say that Bridgie and Victoria, you know, that have been brought up around that sort of, you know, kind of systemic um, inequality and racism and, and discrimination that's out there. Um, what do you see as the main challenges then uh, for women and, and what kind of role can the likes of your organisation play in, in supporting women? Thanks, Sinead. Um, I think, uh, I, I think, you know, national government need to step up to the mark, you know, uh, I, I, and I think local government, not so much will follow suit, but certainly if they work in tandem with the, each other, there is going to be a better outcome. I mean, there isn't a migrant-led organisation, and but there is now a traveller-led organisation, which is absolutely wonderful for Clare, um, and the, uh, um, the the presence of the PPN with 320 community group membership is excellent. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it needs to go further. It, it needs um, local representation, uh, uh, local representatives and local authorities really educating themselves. You know, so it's it's not only about you know. Um, 
getting women to put themselves forward, but it's about addressing the issues that prevent them yeah. from what are the, what, From a very practical perspective, what do you think those issues are? Like over the years, as you've been working on the ground with women, what have you seen that the very very practical issues? Well, you know, as Madeline said earlier, you know, having to put a child in, 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 into, into the back of a car or, you know, or, you know, having to leave a child, you know, kind of at two weeks old, I mean, it's a huge barrier, you know, mm. kind of, if, you know, if you fall at, fall into a minority or ethnic uh, group, um, your chan the chan the more uh, multiple of disadvantages, you know, it, the slimmer the chance of you following that path into politics. And certainly in my role, you know, I would have found that women w would struggle even with the concept around entering into politics. I've had women saying to me, I don't have enough dinner on the table sure. this evening you know so poverty is an issue I mean Madeleine also spoke about you know local say for example credit credit unions or whatever like that you know there has to be a really well-rounded uh, a, a well-rounded approach to this that doesn't only just tick one box like quotas it has to be you know what is the practice what is the culture and um, a, a female politician said to me yesterday she said um, that um, women being being considered emotional is viewed as negative by men in politics. And she said, but as long as men are in, are in power, we will only look at the facts and we will never look at the effects of the issue. Mm -hmm. And I just thought that really captured it for me because I think women have the capacity to get into the heart of things. Of things and we, we're not, I don't believe we're looking to, uh, you know, to go in and replicate a male perspective. We're bringing a female perspective, which is entirely different. We have an entirely different set of skills. We have an entire, we have entirely different uh, uh, viewpoints and experiences mm. in, in the life, which are completely and utterly valid and which um, should be represented. Yeah. Um, so I suppose what um, the barriers are, but one of the things that really needs to happen is actually men need to stand down. Simple, men need to stand down okay. and they need to make room for women. And it's interesting, like, as I said, when you look at that statistic that Michelle gave us, you know, such a low majority of a, such a very, very tiny minority, sorry, mm. um, of women over the last few years. Like, do you do you think there are, you know, very fundamental changes like that? So the quota system, for, for instance, is one. Um, uh, mechanism that is suggested where that where uh, parties are required to put forward a certain percentage of women up for election. Um, do you also think? The, I mean, we have a, an ongoing issue of career politicians. Yes. There should be a break off date. You know, you can't do it. There's probably people still in Clare County Council from 1979. <laughs> that might be stretching. But I mean, <laughs> but there's possibly still someone there since Madeline was there. You know, so it, it's a case of. 10 years is more than enough. Can we mm. not just pick a figure of the number of years and say, I've done my bit. I trust the younger generation to take over. Yeah. I trust the diversity coming up behind me. I don't have to be in charge all the time. And until those people step out of the way, we won't be able to have space for the next Yeah, generation. and like we've talked about kind of racism and ableism and that sort of thing, but ageism is a huge issue, isn't yeah. it? Definitely in terms of kind of... A, that's it's not even know. ageism. I mean, you could go in at 18 and leave at 28. It's, it's but what I mean is that, you know, kind of there is almost sometimes I think there might be a sense that younger women or younger people just don't have the capacity yeah. oh, to engage not, yeah. in the same no, I, way. I'd rather, I'd rather and that people feel people. they almost have to protect <laughs> democracy by staying in place, you know, by God forbid you hand it over to the younger generation. No, I'd love for the younger generation in charge. <laughs> yeah. Victoria, do you have anything to say on that as our well, in terms of a younger activist? Well, I think that like Theresa has a point, especially when you look at a lot of the issues. Um, that plague Ireland today, like the housing crisis, that overwhelmingly affects young people. Mm. Myself and many of my friends aren't able to move out because rents are too high. We're not getting, we can't get move into jobs, uh, like careers because um, like they're asking for like five years experience. And like, you're, you're kind of thinking these people are 25, come on, give us a chance. Mm. Like, so I think having young people in the council and in the doll will help us tackle these issues. A lot of the people in the doll are what 40s, 50s, permanent pensionable jobs, and then go into the doll. They don't know what we're talking about. Mm. They don't, things were a lot simpler back in their day. And <clears throat> a lot of the issues that are affecting us, they just see it as, oh, the young people have come again. They're complaining. 
whining, you know, they're so well educated, yet they can't seem to like get themselves out of their situation when it's not like that. It's because of the structures around us that sure. prevented us from doing that. But we are called all sorts of names. We're like, oh, keyboard warriors come out again or the snowflakes, you know. Yeah. Um, so I think it is very important to have um, younger people involved in politics, but a lot of young people would say, well, what has politics ever done for me? You know? Well, indeed, there is that challenge, isn't there? And Do you I was want to just going to add to that, even at local authority level, you know, the strategic planning, the up, you know, the you know policies around how resources are shared aren't equality proofed. Okay. So then you have local representatives, and you're hoping um, that um, our local, um, our locally elected representatives have. Um, like the, an understanding of diversity and equality. And so, for example, we still here in Clare have been exposed to public representatives publicly speaking against the rights of travellers to have a place to live. Mm -hmm. we, we, the idea that disabled people, that we only need a social service, that we're not mothers, that we're not workers, that, we're, you know, that we yeah. don't need a home to live. So, yeah. you know, I, I do feel concerned that um, you know this idea that you know just because you're a woman and you're elected means that that's going to solve the, the 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 issue, and I suppose I I'm putting that challenge to our currently elected women to do better from a gender equality perspective to actually speak about it to pass more motions to actually challenge racism and ableism and all those issues and and issue press releases and stop colluding with the inequality that we have to live with because that's what's happening. Like for me, I'm still um, carrying the radio interviews when some elect females, women, defended the, uh, the chairperson who commented around the high heels of women. How were we not outraged? Elaine was the only person who spoke against it. So I would also ask from today that we have a women's caucus, that all of you who are elected, that you have a women's caucus and those of us who want to turn up at the meetings on a monthly basis or every two months and that we discuss diversity and equality and that you represent us because you're the people that are going to change the men in there to make the space for us to get elected. And I guess, you know, obviously the councillors here, you have a key role in that. Yeah. Um, and, and also, we'll I We'll support things, you and you support us. Yeah, and idea. also I do think, I mean, actually one of the things that you, you said, Teresa, which I thought was very interesting, was that not everyone wants to be at the forefront of a yes. political yeah. role. And that there's lots of ways to be involved. And so, for instance, you've been very actively involved in, um, you know, working through the PPN to support local people to have a voice. And, and that is another way, isn't it? That that so so you've made an actual decision yourself yeah. not to necessarily yeah. go into the political sphere, but to stay in the activist sphere. Yeah, somebody called me once years ago, an agitator, and I got very disappointed with that. Well, what an agitator? What that sounded awful thing to say. But actually, at the end of the day, if you think about, I won't say the council is a cesspool. <laughs> But somebody Don't. needs to agitate it to get things moving. Otherwise, it never changes. So we need agitators and we need people mm -hmm. prodding and prodding and prodding and making a change. And I find, I would actually find it very um, frustrating to be in the council, you know, because I'm a climate activist. I, while I, I really do, I have talked for travellers inside, I've talked for every, every, especially through the PPN, because you get loads of more insight. Um, and I'm quite happy to bring other issues but I'm not happy to say that I want to be looking after all of the people in North Clare's medical cards and things like that. You know, I don't have time so for So it's that. different, it's different, different strokes for different yes, folks, I mean, if you like. You yeah. can be, you can, what I had it written down, you can be broad, you can go into the council, you have to have a broad focus. Sure. But when you're an activist and agitator, you need a narrow focus on what that <coughs> issue is. Yeah. And we need to do that. And we need climate activists poking at the politicians constantly to change things. And they need to hear us. Yeah. And I love the idea of a caucus that's completely missing because, uh, you know, all these political parties have their meetings and they talk about their agenda and their manifesto, but they don't actually talk to each other. And in the PPN, we collaborate. We all work together. There's no, I'm not talking to them because I'm part of this party. It's all about, we all work together. We all talk about the environment. We all talk about social issues, justice issues. We all talk about ordinary issues, everything. Mm. And I think that's missing within a council. It's nearly like this competition. 
I hate that we need to work together for to move forward with and any progress. And it's the interdependency of those issues that we get to talk yeah, about so through the trans- PPN, and that's amazing. Okay, yeah. Yeah. and and so we'll be going on to questions and answers in a minute. But it'd be interesting actually to see if there are, if there are questions about the caucus and um you know and how so across the country maybe just for people who may not be familiar with the caucus structure, caucuses the plural of caucus I've discovered is caucuses because I checked it. <laughs> caucuses have been set up all over the country where women uh, across parties and uh, independent um, um, councillors come together to form uh, a group of women all working together in their council area to represent the voice of women in their council area. And so the party structure kind of disappears and the political side of it disappears and that kind of shared and common approach comes to the fore. Uh, and I think you're saying that, you know, a caucus in Clare would be great. Listen, again, I'm really conscious of the time. I just want to ask you very quickly, any last kind of bits of advice or nuggets that you'd give to the audience or, or, or challenges that you'd give to the audience before we finish off in terms of uh, equality and, uh, and diversity in local government? Uh, um, yes, I'd like to say that, you know... I'll, I'll, I'll just maybe ask you to lead in a bit there, sorry, oh, yeah. yeah. Um, I don't expect anyone to represent me that doesn't look like me or that, you know, that I, I expect people to have um, the the freedom to represent themselves. Okay. The, the, the needs of, you know, um, various groups in society are not going to be met by, you know, people outside of those groups. They need to represent themselves. You know, and another thing that um, was brought to my attention yesterday, and we're always given out about um, how much pay politicians get, but at local level, uh, at the local authority, it's, I think, 27,000. It's really very little. The point was made to me yesterday that the, a large majority of the men at local level have other incomes yeah and and you know and that women entering into politics you know kind of will only have this uh, which I don't know how it sounds to people, 27,000, but it's not very much money, you know, in terms of keeping a family going, in terms of being on constant call, you know, um, and not having the freedom to, to uh, move uh, about the country in the same way uh, that, you know, Peter referred to earlier. <laughs> you know, um, that, you know, the, the, we don't, most women don't have wives at home, you know, and I think uh, some of this, um, some, and some do, of course, uh, and um, I think, uh, you know, some of this has its birth in the absolute non-recognition of the unpaid work that women do yeah. and the huge contribution, and interestingly enough, which is usually behind the scenes, you know, um, that women make, which completely goes yeah. unnoticed and undervalued. Yeah, and often women are kind of, you know, would say, oh, no, I'll stay behind the scenes and, you know, kind of be the power behind. But, you know, it's, it's there's something about challenging ourselves as well around coming forward, be, being out there. Yeah. Listen, I'm going to draw this panel conversation to a close. Okay. Again, I'd love to continue to chat to you, but I'd uh, like to thank you all very much for coming. Uh, I'm going to ask you to stay where you are, but just uh, maybe a round of applause for our panellists. Thank you. Thank you.